21 public meeting of the Virginia Beach Planning Commission. My name is David Weiner. I'm the chair of the commission. Um, at this time, I've asked Mr. Costin to please lead us in prayer. Uh, everybody, please stand. <laughs> Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this glorious day. God, we thank you for all the benefits of life, God, that you have afforded us. Now, God, we ask as we come to discuss business, God, that you would give us your wisdom and your direction. Lead us in the proper way, O oh God. God, we ask that you would continue to be with us and guide us in all that we do. Bless this city and all its citizens. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Would you please join me in the pledge to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, next, Mr. Redmond has graciously volunteered to introduce the members. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone start right over there that pretty lady on the end is Kay Wilson she is a deputy city attorney in charge of land use matters and she's here every month um, assisting us and generally keeping us straight next to Kay is Mr. John Costin John is a retired fire captain who serves at large uh, we're down a couple people today so it's a little bit of a, of a truncated group um, next up is George Alcaraz. George is in, he, well, he's got a bunch of different things that he does. He's a business person, he's a contractor, he owns some restaurants, um, and he represents the Beach District. Dee, does a, Dee Oliver does a number of different things, too. She's in the funeral business, she's an author, she's a restaurateur, she's, I don't know what else I'm leaving out, so don't be offended, <laughs> but she does a lot of things, and Dee is a past chairman uh, and vice chairman of our uh, commission, and she is, uh, and she serves at large. Next to D is Mr. Donald Horsley. He is a farmer uh, and a Hokie, and he represents, uh, well, he serves at large, but he, is, uh, he knows more about the Princess Anne District than anybody I know. Um, so we basically just do whatever he says down there. Um, uh, in the center there is Mr. David Weiner. He is uh, our chairman. He represents the, um, the Kempsville District. He is, a, um, he is a, a commercial salesman in the building industry. Jack Wall, to Dave's left, is an engineer. He represents the Rose Hall District, and he is our vice chairman. <clears throat> this gentleman to my right is Mr. Michael Inman. He is an attorney. He, too, serves at large. Um, my name is Dave Redmond. I am a uh, commercial real estate broker. I represent the Bayside District. That gentleman is Whitney Graham. Um, he is a developer and property uh, manager and owns a number of different types of real estate, uh, and he represents the Lynn Haven District. That fellow is Bobby Tahan. He is our planning director, um, and, uh, uh, and he's going to introduce a number of his staff. We all rely on him for any number of things, of course, um, and he'll keep you up with everyone else. Mr. Tahan. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Clerking today, we have Nicole Garrido and Pam Sandloop. Uh, starting with the rest of the planning staff, we also have uh, Carolyn Smith, our planning administrator, our current planning team, Waddow and Marshall Coleman. Uh, along with them, we have our two interns that are interning with the planning administration team, Grace Pullen and Maddie Lohman. Uh, we have Ashby Moss, our interim zoning administrator, Hank Morrison, also in zoning, Aubrey Troublecock in uh, Development Services Center, and Rick Lohman, the city traffic engineer, as well as uh, Will, uh, well, I'm trying to look around. Yeah, uh, Will Miller uh, with uh, our zoning enforcement with our short-term rental team. Online, we also have Carrie Bookholt, the Development Services Center Administrator as well. A very talented group. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, next order of business, um, Madam Clerk, would you uh, go over the rules and the explanation of how the procedure worked today? Sure. Today we will have both in-person speakers and speakers participating via WebEx. When an agenda item has been called, we will recognize the applicant or their representative first, whether they are in person or participating via WebEx. Following the applicant or their representative, in-person speakers will be called next and then the speakers participating via WebEx. For WebEx speakers, please wait two to three seconds to begin to ensure the commission hears your complete remarks. Please note, if the speaker does not respond or if a technical issue occurs which renders the comments unintelligible, we will move on to the next speaker or the next order of business. Public hearing rules. The Virginia Beach Planning Commission takes pride in being fair and courteous to all parties in attendance. 
It is important that all involved understand how the Commission normally conducts its meetings. It is equally important that everyone treat each other and the members of the Commission with respect and civility. The Commission requests that if you have a cell phone, please either silence it or turn it off. This is an abbreviated explanation of the rules. The complete set of rules is located in the front of the Planning Commission agenda. Following is the order of business for this public hearing. Withdrawals and deferrals. The Chairman will ask if there are any requests to withdraw or defer an item on the agenda. Consideration of these requests will be made first. Consent agenda. The second order of business is a consideration of the consent agenda, which are those items that the Planning Commission believe are unopposed and which have favorable staff recommendation. Regular agenda. The Commission will then proceed with the remaining items on the agenda. Speakers in support or opposition of an agenda item will have three minutes to speak unless they are solely representing a large group, such as a Civic League or Homeowners Association, in which case they will have 10 minutes. Please note that the actions taken by the Commission today are in the form of a recommendation to the Virginia Beach City Council. Final decision to approve or disapprove an application will be made by the City Council. Commission thanks you for your attendance and we hope that your experience today leaves you feeling that you have been heard and treated fairly. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, next, does anybody have any items to be deferred or withdrawn today? Mr. Chair, if I may, just for, uh, for the public, as you come up to speak, please make sure that you speak directly into the microphone so that we can hear you. We are, uh, it is very sensitive to not pick up anything if you stand back far away. So please speak up and speak directly into the microphone. I'm sorry, Mr. No, Chair. No problem. Thank you. Any items to be deferred or withdrawn? Uh, the Chair is aware that item number 12 is going to be deferred for 30 days. Um, may I have a motion, please? <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we uh, defer agenda item number 12, Murphy's of Virginia Beach. For 30 days. For 30 days. I have a motion. Do you have a second? Second. We have a motion by Mr. Wall, second by Mr. Horsley. The vote is open. Okay. By recorded vote of nine in favor and zero against, agenda item number 12 has been deferred for 30 days. Thank you. Um, next, we will move on to the consent agenda, and our Vice Chair Wall will take over the consent. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, these are applications that are recommended for approval by staff, and the Planning Commission concurred, and there are no speakers signed up in opposition. <clears throat> there, <clears throat> we have five items on the consent agenda today. Uh, first item is Jarrett Simmons. Um, for conditional use permit for alternative residential developments at 2841 West Gibbs Road. Is there a representative for this item? Yep. Please come up. <clears throat> uh, please state your name for the record. Jarrett Simmons. And are the conditions um, of the application acceptable? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any opposition for this? Yeah. Is there any opposition for this um, item being placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, um, we've asked Mr. Horsley to read this into the record. Hi, hey, Mr. Wall. The um, first thing I've got to read this letter. Pursuant to the state and local government conflict of interest, I am making the following declaration. I'm executing this written disclosure regarding the Planning Commission discussion and vote at the August Planning Commission meeting on item number one, Jared Simmons, 2841, should be West Gibbs Road. I farm the property to the rear of the applicant's property. However, there are no, there are more than three adjacent properties, so I am a member of a group. As such, I derive no financial interest from this application. Therefore, I will disclose that I am a member of a group adjacent properties that have no financial interest, interest in this application, and I will vote. Please record this declaration in the official record of the Planning Commission. Now, to the real business. <laughs> the applicant for this application is requesting condition use permit for alternative residential development to construct one single 
family dwelling on this slightly less than 12 acre parcel of AG1 and AG2 agricultural land. Um, this is kind of a normal thing that happens down in the rural area. Um, the question to, to me was why, why there was a statement put on the uh, subdivision plat, and I will read that subdivision plat a statement. The intent of the request is to, set, to, to satisfy a note on the subdivision plat recorded in 2008, which, which states, Parcel B is not a building site until a conditional use permit or alternative residential development has been approved by the Virginia Beach City Council and approval for the installation of an on-site sewage disposable system and private well have been granted by the Virginia Beach Department of Public Health. So that being said, uh, we, we still don't know why that was put on the subdivision plant because most all homes down there, all homes down there have to have a health permit for a septic system and a well. So, so really, whether it was on the plant or not. So, anyway, uh, there couldn't be any reason for that to be found for for putting that on the plant. But it's a con this is a very normal thing to uh, build uh, single family dwellings on these this size parcel down there. So. Wasn't any objection. We just wanted to clarify that one little glitch, so uh, so we decided to put put it on the consent agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Horsley. The uh, the next item on the the consent agenda is agenda item number eight, uh, Virginia Beach Development Authority, and Virginia Beach Development Authority and FROB LLC um, modification of proffers. Um, address um, is a portion of the corporate landing business park. Um, is there a representative for this item? Oh, it's the city. It's the city. Okay. Um, and we're just gonna. Do we? There she is. Here, Andy and Emily. Okay. Here's Mr. Royal. For the record, Randy Royal, Kilmer Horn and Associates. I am kind of tagging that. John Richardson was formally representing it, but I was representing uh, economic development on this, so I, I guess I can stand in if you need be. Okay. Are the um, are the proffers um, acceptable? Yes, sir. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thank Good. you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there is there any opposition for this item being placed on the consent agenda? <clears throat> Emily, we're going to. Uh, we're going to go ahead and read it. Uh, uh, Mr. Redmond's going to go ahead and read this into the record. That's okay. Excuse me. Okay. If we could make a clarification, um, Mr. A Royal. Project. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Dr. Yeah. Johnny's. Uh, okay. It's okay. No. Okay, Emily, you can come on up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we understand that the development authority is the actual applicant. Correct. And so. I'm well, on the economic department staff that helped write that. Okay. Okay. Representing that today. Okay. Thank you. And, and thank you. Because the proffers are acceptable in mm -hmm. this case. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so again, is there any? There's no opposition. Um, is there any opposition for this item I'm being placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, um, you know, we've asked uh, Mr. Redmond to read this into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wall. This is an application by the Virginia Beach Development Authority. The owners of the property of Virginia Beach Development Authority and Frob LLC which is an adjacent property owner. And this is a modification of proffers. Specifically, the application is seeking a modification of proffers to update the design criteria for a portion of Corporate Landing Business Park. The park property was rezoned in 1988, and the design criteria was adopted in 1990, with an amendment added in 1998. The new design criteria seek to ensure that the Corporate Landing Business Park remains relevant for current and future market opportunities, reduce redundancy and to better align the document with current codes and requirements, to consolidate multiple subsequent amendments into one user-friendly and attractive document, to permit more flexibility with new and innovative materials and construction methods, and provide more guidance on light industrial and advanced manufacturing building types. In short, the purpose um, of this amendment is to modernize the design criteria, the 31-year-old design criteria for Corporate Landing Business Park, which very recently has enjoyed a burst of uh, interest and activity of which we all should be um, quite happy and proud. If you think about it, the car you drove 31 years today is quite a bit different than the one you might have today. And design criteria um, 
for a project the size of corporate landing very probably ought to be modernized just as your transportation means would be as well. There is beginning um, on page three of the staff uh, report on this particular item, a table which lists uh, the changes from the current design criteria to the updated design criteria. I will not um, uh, uh, recite them all here. If anybody has any questions about how specifically the criteria are changing, I would uh, urge you to consult the staff report on this. Uh, on, in short, it is a modernization um, of how uh, Corporate Landing Business Park is to be designed. The city and an adjacent property owner are the applicants. There are no, there is no opposition to the request. Planning Commission therefore places it on consent. Mr. Wall. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the next item on the uh, the consent agenda is, is item number nine, TVTI LLC, um, and uh, Tower Ventures, um, Garav Liu Ketzerman, um, and Pleasant Valley Associates, uh, who's the property owner. Uh, this is for modifications of conditions for a communications tower. Is there a representative for this item? Can you please state your name for the record? Lou Katzerman. And are the uh, conditions acceptable? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any opposition for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we've asked uh, Mr. Graham to read this into the record. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is an application by TVTI LLC doing business as Tower Ventures, um, Lou uh, Katzerman. This is at the Pleasant Valley Shopping Center. Um, this is a request uh, for modifications uh, to uh, uh, of conditions for a uh, communication tower. In 2008, City Council granted a conditional use permit for the installation of a 132-foot high flagpole communication tower on this property. The approval included uh, a deviation to the setback and the screening and landscaping requirements. The tower was constructed following the approval. However, it was removed in, uh, from the site in 2017. A new cell tower operator, the applicant, seeks to install a new 134 foot high monopine uh, communication tower. This is a uh, cell tower designed to resemble a pine tree at the uh, location. Uh, as the proposed tower will have a significantly different design than what was previously approved and is taller by two feet, a modification of conditions is requested. Um, while the previous tower was designed as a flagpole, uh, with internal ant antennas, the proposed tower will have external antennas and mimic the shape of a pine tree. Um, staff has uh, asked the applicant to consider uh, a uh, different design, more of a flagpole. However, the uh, pine tree design uh, apparently um, has, in, has uh, the, the previous design cannot accommodate um, the internal antennas. So anyway, uh, planning uh, staff recommends approval, and uh, we agree with planning staff. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, the next item on the consent agenda is agenda item number 10, uh, Ted Tigner, uh, for change in nonconformity at 501 Carolina Avenue. Uh, is there a representative for this item? There is not. Um, however, he has expressed to, um, to staff that he uh, finds the conditions acceptable um, for this this application. Is there any opposition for this application um, to be on the consent agenda? Um, hearing none, we've asked uh, Mr. Uckrest to read this into the record. Thank you. Uh, the applicant, Ted uh, Tigner, has asked for a residential expansion for nonconforming use. The site is developed with two detached single-family dwellings constructed in 1945, the principal dwelling fronts Carolina Avenue. In 1950, a smaller secondary dwelling was constructed on the rear portion of the front uh, fronting on Baltic Avenue. Following the adoption of the zoning ordinance for the city of Virginia Beach in 1957, the presence of more than one single family dwelling on a single lot was prohibited within the R5S residential district. Therefore, the use of this 
site is considered legally non-conforming. The applicant is proposing a 1,020 square foot addition and renovations to the principal structure to include replacement of the vinyl siding and hardy planks, uh, plank siding, construction of living room, playroom, entertainment room, bedroom, and bathroom, elimination, elimination of the existing rear deck, and a conversion of the front downstairs bedroom to a sunroom. No changes are proposed to the 600 foot dwelling unit. The dwelling unit is grandfathered for short term rental uses. The maximum lot coverage permitted for a single family dwelling in the R5S district is 40%. With the proposed addition, the calculated total lot coverage, including the rear secondary dwelling, will increase from 41% to 46%. The staff, along with planning commission, um, their opinion is that the scale and location of the proposed addition is appropriate and the character of the surrounding residential community and therefore no detrimental impacts to surrounding product, uh, properties. For the record, staff has stated that the applicant has accepted the conditions for the um, 21 by 16 and 6 inch addition. For that reason, we're putting it on consent agenda. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Akaras. Um, the next item on the consent agenda is agenda item number 11, Thomas A. Brown, for subdivision variants. Um, the address is Indian River Road. Uh, is, is there a representative for this item? Thank you, Commissioner Wall, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Eddie Burdon, Virginia Beach Attorney, representing Mr. Brown. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Aubrey uh, for his work on the application. All three conditions as recommended are acceptable. Um, I wanted to, because since it came up in the informal, we will provide a new exhibit before it goes to council showing the shared driveway between parcels C1 and C2. It will split the property line that's shared between them and go back at least 30 feet before it splits off. But we'll, we will provide that, but I wanted to put that on the record. Thank, Thank you for okay. putting on the consent agenda. Appreciate Thank it. You. Is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we've asked Mr. Costa to read this into the record. Uh, thank you, sir. The applicant, Thomas Brown, is proposing to subdivide two lots along Indian River Road, a parcel designated as 1.9 acres and residual of parcel C is 0.24 acres. In order to create a total of three lots on property zoned R10 residential zoning district, the dimensional standards for lots in this district require a lot size of at least 10,000 square feet and a minimum lot width of 80 feet, which is measured at the 30-foot front, front yard set, setback. The proposals, lo, proposed lots will all exceed the minimum lot size with areas of 35,869 square feet, 42,852 square feet, and 13,718 square feet. However, one of the lots will be 4. One nine feet shy of the minimum lot width required of 80 feet. The proposal will result in three residential lots with lot areas as stated before, all above the minimum requirement. Staff recommends approval and the planning commission concurs. Okay, thank you, Mr. Costum. Um, that was the last item on the regular consent agenda. Um, the planning commission also places the following applications for condition use permit for short-term rental on the consent agenda as they meet the applicable requirements for section 241.2 of the zoning ordinance. Um, staff and the planning commission supports the applications and there are no speakers sign up in opposition. Um, these are ap agenda items number 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. <clears throat> um, Mr. Chair, that was the last item on the consent agenda. Um, I move for approval of agenda items number 1, 8, 9, 10, 11, and short-term rental items number 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Right, we have a motion for approval. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Just a second. Uh, uh, no, hold on a second. Hold on, we're getting there. Hold on a second. We have a motion by Mr. Wall, a second uh, by Mrs. Oliver, and do we have any I body abstaining? Um, oh, Mr. Chair, ahead, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I have. Uh, go ahead. I have. A, I'll read, go ahead and read yours. I have a letter persuading to the state and local government conflict of interest act. I have a letter on file making the following declaration: uh, uh, the, 
agenda item uh, number one is financed by uh, town bank and um, I'm hereby make this disclosure that I serve on an advisory board at town bank which uh, makes no loan decisions and I believe that I can participate in this transaction fairly objectively and in the public interest and I plan to participate and, and vote on this item Mr. Inman um, likewise um, I'll make the following declaration that um, Uh, agenda item number one being financed by town bank um, I serve on the advisory board of town bank make no decisions on loans and feel like I can participate fairly in this trends in this uh, vote okay. mr. Edmund <coughs> short term rentals hey I'm happy to do it now we're not there yet but I will we are, just... we're there oh we are there okay uh, I have a letter on file with the city attorney's office and have for some months um, I have a uh, client who is in the travel uh, industry and has some business that um, is involved with short-term rentals therefore I do not vote on any short-term rental applications um, or any of the ordinances with regard to short-term rentals um, and I repeat that that letter um, which I renew monthly is on file with the city attorney sounds good thank you Adam clerk that's everything okay votes open By recorded vote of nine in favor and zero against, agenda items one, eight, nine, 10, and 11 have been recommended for approval. By recorded vote of eight in favor, zero against, with one abstention, agenda items 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 have been recommended for approval. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for all those who've been on the, or on the consent agenda. Your items will now be moved up to uh, city council. Um, and you'll be uh, let, let you know when that'll be scheduled. All right, now we will move on to items two and three. Okay, agenda items two and three, two applications submitted by Submit Properties, first being for a conditional rezoning, AG1 and AG2 agricultural district and conditional I1 light industrial to conditional I1 light industrial district, and an application for a conditional use permit bulk storage yard on property located at 2097 Harpers Road in the Beach District. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Thank you, Ms. Sandaloop. Mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Burdon, Virginia Beach attorney, representing um, the applicant. Uh, I want to first of all um, let you all know that uh, I'm going to make some, a few brief remarks, uh, but Randy Royal with Kimley Horn has been done the, the um, big lift on this and has all any details that you all detailed questions about so I'm going to have Randy come up and finish the presentation but first of all I want to let the Commission know that um, both <coughs> Linda Chapel Linda Taylor Chapel whose property this is is in attendance as are um, Hunter Nichols and Brian Hall with uh, Samet properties and as I said Randy <coughs> will be uh, finishing up the presentation the um, the property looking at the big picture uh, is has been in the Taylor family for almost 70 years. Uh, it is subject to an ACUS easement from the, that the development rights were restricted by the Department of the Navy that's over 40 years old. Our comprehensive plan for over 45 years has designated this area as um, a light industrial uh, development area. It's currently in the current comprehensive plan, it's called the Special Economic Growth Area Number 3 South Oceana. I'm familiar with all this because our family owns uh, significant farmland that's adjacent, well, close to being adjacent, um, across Dam Neck and to the west on Dam Neck, on both sides of Dam Neck, uh, we have the same cir circumstance and situation. So um, <clears throat> this property has, has for as long as, since I was in early college years, uh, been uh, industrial, but that's the future of this property this, and this area. So it's in the highest noise zone. And there are no houses, I don't believe, that exist that can see this from their house. Um, so just just be clear. And Randy's had public meetings on, on the application. I think there's only one speaker signed up uh, in uh, in opposition to this. Uh, the you know, but th this is exactly why <clears throat> this property is here. It's perfect for what's being proposed. The other application for the um, <clears throat> Data center. Uh, this pro this piece is a, is a part of this, but this piece is three and a half times larger than that was. 
uh, yet the building is only about 24 percent, 23 percent larger than that building was. But there is a lot more uh, parking associated with it. So with that, um, I'm going to let Randy come up and, uh, and make a few points, and then we'd have to answer any questions. Thank you. I would note that Randy's a whole lot more seasonally appropriately dressed than I am. <laughs> we noticed. <laughs> Good afternoon. Again, Randy Royal, Kimley Horn Associates, 4525 Main Street. Um, as Eddie said, I met with the neighbors. Uh, it's a, there's not a good way to reach out to the neighbors. So we're not organized civic league. So what I did was I reached out to the same folks that had helped me with the next Fin project, the folks in the community, and said, please send out a notice. And I sent them a notice saying what time, rented a room, et cetera. Uh, I had eight people show up. From various neighborhoods but met with them answered all their questions uh, primarily concerned with traffic and stormwater stormwater of course we've gone through the preliminary design process you can see from the concept plan we've got two ponds we've also got underground storage not only to accommodate our site but there's some backup from existing areas all of that has been handled with staff we'll work out the final details with the final site plan but the preliminary design doesn't show it up there but shows that we can mitigate and have zero impact on the downstream system there from a traffic standpoint this particular user it's a 24 7 operation but that also allows them to set the shifts for times that are off peak times likewise the distribution aspect of it all of that happens in off hours the the everything goes out from 9 50 to 10 50 in the morning which is not a rush hour. They are out all day. They come back at like 8 o'clock at night. So based upon that, there was no impact on the AM peak hour, and there was a very nominal, small impact on the PM peak hour. And Mr. Lohman's here and has reviewed the traffic study. So again, no problems there. Uh, didn't really have anything we couldn't answer for the folks at the neighborhood, but I will stand by for questions. Staff's recommended approval. We hope you will do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, oh, we'll see. Sure, we Mr. Wallace, question. Well, I mean, I see there are 1,500 parking spaces there, and so that's not going. That to was add. a question that the neighbors asked too. I probably should have covered that. This this operation, we've got 200 employees that work in the warehouse. We also have employees that come in and run the distribution or run the vans out. So, and, and that's really part of the CUP, the conditional use permit for bulk storage is really just vans parked out there and space to load the vans in between it. That's why we need all the spaces we do. It's, it's a well-run operation and that's, that's why we got all the spaces. Yeah, very good question. I'd, I'd... What about maintenance of those vans? I mean, that's not being done on site because it looks like if that's no. 13, that, that building is primarily stuff comes in at night with the tractor trailers, and, and I, I should have said that too. Mm -hmm. Tractor trailers come in from, I think it's 8 at night or 10 at night till like 6 in the morning. Loads up the warehouse, and then they load everything. The deliveries go out the next day and then hit repeat. Any, any repairs and things like that would be done off-site at the appropriate facilities. Mm -hmm. The warehouse is just for distribution. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Madam? We have one speaker, Stephen Johnston. Welcome, sir. Hello. Thank you all for letting me come in and speak today. Um, I was at the meeting. Uh, it was a very good meeting. Um, some questions came up, and then I contacted Randy about them, and we haven't been able to resolve all the issues. Um, we're not opposed to the distribution center. We're opposed to some of the impacts the distribution center is going to have on our neighborhoods and our property rights. Our main concern is traffic. And if you look at the traffic study, it does not account for any of the delivery vans. It only accounts for the employees coming in. Mr. Royal said the vans will go out in the morning, come back at night. I believe the vans will come out in the morning be intermittently coming back and filling up and going back out again with multiple trips of some 800 vehicles. The traffic study is limited to the intersection of <clears throat> Harpers Road and Damnack. 
Our main concern is the intersection of Damneck Road and London Bridge Road. That is the main access to the back gate of Oceana. So therefore, in the morning, it is heavily backed up. Sometimes, if you want to go out onto that intersection, you have to sit for two or three light cycles to get through it. <coughs> um, also, London Bridge Road has now become one of the main thoroughfares getting from Sandbridge and the south the southeastern part of the city of Virginia Beach to get to the interstate. We have ambulances, fire trucks, rescue vehicles, all kinds of first responders, as well as tractor trailers and RV vehicles coming through. Okay, noise. I've been living in Lake Placid for a while. I was there before Damneck Road was there. We went to the public hearings on Damneck Road. And at that time, the city offered to build a sound barrier between our neighborhood and Dam Neck Road. That changed. We have woods between my house and Dam Neck Road. Further down, they have a large berm. The city says that's enough. I live there at night. It is not enough. We're now going to be adding 25 trucks in the middle of the night, driving back and forth there. It's going to disturb our neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> now, with all the vans moving back and forth, that's not a concern. Uh, the site plan indicates that they are electric, electric vans, so there should be minimal noise during the day. It's the noise at night that's going to concern us. <clears throat> the site, if you, if you see the larger site plan, I don't know if they can put it up or not, to the east of the site are two public schools, Corporate Landing Elementary School, Corporate Landing Middle School. According to the Virginia State guidelines, you cannot have a school near a light industrial zone. So who's going to pay the $90 million to relocate those schools? Last time the rezoning was here, they only requested to rezone the one parcel where the data center was. They're now requesting to rezone that entire section. And once that's rezoned as light industrial, the owners can buy right, put in what they want, and have access to Dam Neck Road. And if you bear with me, I have one last item, if I can. Oh, yes, sir, go ahead. Very short. Okay. Uh, site lighting. Currently, the city doesn't have any site lighting standards. I've been through this. I've talked with Barbara Henley. She's looking into it. Some were submitted about two years ago. They're still looking for them. Um, there are no rec the recommended actions in, in the report. Talk, do not indicate dark skies compliant lighting fixtures. There are very general statements saying lights will be pointed down, minimal glare. But if the fixtures really rated dark skies, we get less light into the SIG. There's no limit on the lighting levels indicated. They can blast the, blast the parking lot to 20-foot candles, so they can keep down to five. We don't know. There's no limitations. There's no requirement to reduce the lighting levels after hours. If you look at the site plan, they've got a huge lot for, park, for parking the vans. They're, they said they're not going to use the vans at night. Why should those be fully lit at night? We can reduce that lighting level, reduce the light pollution. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. For you. Um, where is Lake Placid on? Is it down towards London? Isn't it down towards London Bridge Road and Damneck? Yes, it's the corner of London Bridge and Damneck. Okay. Put the map back up. Mm. Uh, it doesn't show up on the map. It doesn't show up on the map. It's if you look right here, Mike. It's too far away. It's it's down this area down here. So, okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Thank you. I said. No, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. So Lake Placid's behind the there's um the Junior Mark and the Miller Mark. Yes. That's right. Okay. Yes. But it's the light pollution. There it At, is. It's kind of, and you see it's straight yeah, down the bottom, London Bridge. Kind of left hand. You know, corner tonight, there. tonight, tomorrow, I'm going out, watch the meter shower. We put this in without any restrictions on uplighting. I may not be able to see it next year. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, first of all, um, if you could put the the uh, aerial photo wide shot that was up a second ago. I'd appreciate it. Appreciate Mr. Johnson's um, thoughts on this application. Um, now, the, the one that's an aerial photo that's got, you can see the, the right there. forested there areas. Right there. Thank there, you. there we go. Very nice. All right. So um, I'm not sure where in Lake Placid Mr. Johnson lives, but um, the woods, if, if he is in proximity to Dam Neck Road, the woods that are behind his house are on one of my family's properties that will one day have light industrial on it. Um, <clears throat> the, the woods that you see, uh, you can see the site in black <coughs> to, the, to the left or to the west, 
There's uh, one piece that we don't own, but as you get further to the west, it's, it's wooded. Um, our farm includes the property at the bottom left, um, and all the woods that are between it and Dam Neck are on our property. Lake Placid, you go back to the original picture that you had up there, the composite. Um, <clears throat> you could not see this property from Lake Placid, which is outside the red box there on the far left. And there's commercial, not just the junior market, but two other commercial buildings that are also on London Bridge Road um, adjacent to Lake Placid. This property, with all the woods and everything else, you, you won't, they will not see anything, period. Um, I, I don't know if I understood the, the backup he was speaking about. I don't think, you, I'm sure it wasn't at Harper's because that doesn't exist um, as far as a backup of three light cycles. My family has owned all this property. My grandfather <coughs> and, and family have owned this property for um, close to 90 years. Um, <coughs> and once again, it's all one day going to be light industrial. That's what our comprehensive plan has called for for 45 years. So um, this particular um, applicant with this particular application um, has, is, doing, is doing everything uh, that should be done. Your staff's in favor. Uh, the the lighting there's a specific condition about lighting uh, we're they're not gonna <laughs> it's not gonna light up their neighborhood in any way shape manner or form it's all got to be directed downward and it's certainly not going to have any impact uh, on this on Lake Placid or any of the other residential neighborhoods for that matter um, as far as the um, traffic question I'll let Randy take take that on because he's more familiar with the uh, traffic impact study than I am but I'll be happy to answer any questions if anybody has Hello. So uh, vans, they were in the traffic study. They do not go in and out. They go out, as I said, between 950, what did I say, 850 and 950? No. 950 and 1050, they are out all day. They come back at the end of the day. They do not go in and out. Harper's Road is our primary access. We have shown improvements on Harper's Road from Dam Neck Road, not from the other end, from Dam Neck Road, which is where everybody will be directed to come, to come in that way, to go out that way, not down the other way. That's why we're widening the road, putting in appropriate turn lanes as we've worked out with Rick Lohman and traffic engineering. Dam Neck Road itself is at about 50% capacity. That's a heck of a lot of capacity out there. There are problems with intersections now, but we're not impacting that because the problems, as everybody knows, are usually at a.m. and p.m. peak hour, and we don't have traffic then. We offset that with what we do. The site lighting standards, we do have a stipulation in there about directing down. We're not necessarily dark sky, but they are directed down. The city does not have foot candle levels, but they do look at our site plans to make sure that we have enough foot candle levels. They're not going to light this to 20 foot candles. That's not prudent for them. It's not necessary. It costs a lot of money. And if there's rationale for lowering the lights at the end of the night when there's nothing happening except inside the warehouse, I'm certain they will, but we can't arbitrarily say we should lower it to 50% or whatever it is. These folks know what they're doing. Um, so again, there are up lighting restrictions that propose to have all the lights turned down and it's not specifically dark sky. That's a whole criteria in itself, but I just can't imagine that there'd be an issue there. So again, any other questions, I'll stand by. Questions, Mr. Rural? No. All right, thank, thank you, you, sir. Madam Clerk, that's no all the speakers. Speaking. All right, we'll close this and open it up amongst us to talk. Mr. Alcarez, this is the beach <laughs> area. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Here's your area. Well, after hearing everything, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm supporting it. Uh, I was hoping to see if there's any concerns that you guys had. Mr. Dorsley? I think, it, I think it's, it's exactly what this property is supposed to be. I mean, we, we protect an Oceana with the air rights and, and uh, to allow the landowners to, to do something else with the property. Light industrial is the right thing to put there. And uh, I think this is exactly, exactly what needs mm -hmm. to be there. And I think they've done all they can do to uh, to protect the in the in the close neighborhoods, and I don't I don't see anything that's really really close to it right now. But uh, 
But anyway, I'm I'm in favor of it. I don't know how it got in the beach district. I thought it would be in Prince of <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But anyway. I did too. That's what <laughs> anyway. But, yeah, okay. I mean, those soybean fields have looked beautiful <laughs> for many years, but they can't they're not going they're not going to be there all the time. So and and uh, mm. we realize that. So so this is a this I think this is the ideal use for this problem. Anyone else? Jack? Uh, it's a lot of imperviousness with that 1,500 um, parking spaces and a 200,000 square foot warehouse, but it uh, looks like they have a fairly robust stormwater management plan and it's gone through initial initial review um, with the city. I think they have had some issues. I don't know if anybody at the city can confirm that you know, Lake Placid on the downstream end I think has had some um, flooding issues in the past, but um, it doesn't look like this is going to impact that and in fact you know may address some other other problems if I understood Mr. Royal correctly that they are adding um, capacity for you know potential other issues okay any other questions or any other anybody else Mr. Redmond Mr. Chairman I move approval of uh, application items number two and three we have a motion for approval to have a second second we have a motion by Mr. Redmond for approval, second by Mr. Akrez. Oh, I'm something? sorry. Mr. Have a disclosure. I have disclosure by Mr. Inman. Yes. Um, one of my uh, law partners represents one of the part, the, the landowner in this. Uh, I don't. I do not have any representation of the landowner, and uh, I'm not involved in this matter. And I believe I can vote without uh, any conflict. Sounds good. We're ready to vote. Vote is open. Mr. Redmond. Mr. Redmond, you need to vote. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Small crisis. <laughs> Thank you. A recorded vote of nine in favor, zero against. Agenda items number two and three have been recommended for approval. All right. Thank you. Uh, on the next item, okay. Our next agenda item is agenda item number four: Wakefield Development LLC, an application for a conditional rezoning R15 residential district and AG1 agricultural district to conditional R10 residential district on property located at 2328 and 2264 Salem Road in the Princess Anne district. So, Representative. Okay. One of the representatives coming up, I just want to remind everybody that I didn't do this before. When, when you come up to the podium to speak, the yellow light will no, come on. When the yellow light comes on, you'll have 30 seconds to wrap up your comments. And when the red light comes on, your time will be up. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, um, for the record, Eddie Berdon, Vintage Attorney representing Wakefield Development LLC on this um, conditional rezoning application. I uh, want to thank uh, Marshall and, and Bill Landfair because he handled this uh, <clears throat> before he left because this has been in process for over a year um, dealing with <coughs> stormwater and you've got the staff recommendation that this will be able to <coughs> meet the stormwater requirements under our current ordinance. The, <coughs> the property with the exception of about 30,000 square feet upon which up in the far upper corner um, has one of the Byler family homes on it. That's the only part of this is not zoned R10. Everything else is zoned R10. <coughs> Excuse me, R15. I apologize, my mistake. Uh, and the request is to rezone it to conditional uh, R10, as Marshall explained this morning. Uh, but with all the open space and with the 1.3 acres of dedicated right of way along Salem Road, 56 feet wide, to include installation of a multi purpose trail along the frontage of um, this property on Salem Road. Uh, <clears throat> the actual density is only 2.14 units per acre. 2.14 units per acre. The, there'll be, if approved, there'll be 84 additional homes above the two uh, Byler homes for which lots are created with this um, subdivision plat. Again, up in the top right, and the, the, <clears throat> it's called out the existing single family uh, Byler residents that will be a part of the uh, the subdivision. <coughs> the we have proffered a very detailed plan that <laughs> includes pedestrian accesses um, eight, that are eight feet wide 
uh, <laughs> within a 20 foot easement that'll be owned and maintained after they're improved by the developer by the, the mandatory membership homeowners association that's also proffered all of these houses will be in one community association mandatory membership the, the when we first started with this project uh, the city wanted um, traffic engineering wanted uh, the stub street that's up in the far left hand corner I think it's South Cross Court but it's the it's South Cross Road comes down and then there's a, a court that goes to the west and then there's a dead end stub street at the side of this property um, from past experience um, and from the, the, the reality that this would be a cut through to Dam Neck Road if it were extended we, we said we weren't going to do that and um, I'm quite certain that uh, <coughs> the folks in Newcastle and the people who live on that uh, there's just two houses that are on, above us in Newcastle don't want that street to go through um, and this process um, is going to see that that doesn't happen if this is approved the um, and the same thing we've added a multi-use path going from the other cul-de-sac to Lisbon which I think is actually I'm not sure what <laughs> it's a city road but I don't think it's a public road uh, but we're providing access there and also access from the cul-de-sac um, down the far um, it'd be the southwest portion of the property so th that people within neighborhood can get all around the neighborhood using you know Lisbon on their bikes their ro roller blades pushing a stroller whatever running uh, and also <coughs> similarly they can run or walk through the Newcastle community up to Dam Neck Road every street within the neighborhood you, we've got you know in the proffers there's a five-foot sidewalk on both sides Trees, street, street trees on both sides. Um, community park that's on here, and then the, the stormwater um, maintenance stormwater pond. But it's going to be an amenity uh, for the neighbor. It's a large pond, and there are wetlands that are being preserved on the site that extend all up in between um, the homes in uh, Village Bend, which is R.75 zoning above this piece of property. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Everything is also community park down the bottom right as well. So there's actually two, two different uh, park sites on here. I'll note that the church that this goes around there, they have dedicated additional right of way previously for Indian River Road, um, or excuse me, Salem Road. <laughs> um, so that trail could be extended across there, but there are two homes, existing homes, not a part of this, separately owned um, for, for many years that, you know, so getting the trail across there is going to, require some city effort in the future um, the staff report you know deals with the fact that we're only adding about 20 houses above what what the existing zoning would permit and we're getting you're getting dedicated property high-end quality project elevations are elevations of homes that are being built today in Kingston Estates on um, West Neck Road just down the street from here the and value the prices we expect to achieve with these um, homes will be 550,000 and above they all have two car garages they all use high quality exterior building material um, again it's just, it's a it's going to be a very high quality neighborhood the only thing I can stand up here and say that that, that failed to do was um, name the neighborhood so we could brand this but the marketing people for whatever reason can never come up with a name so it's just the Byler property for now but it won't be when it goes to to market be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Any questions, Mr. Bedard? No. Hey, oh, hang on, Jack. So th is this is the same de developer as Kingston. Is that is that correct? Or same? That, that's who will be developing the property. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, Mo more? I don't know if you can speak on this, but um, you know, in terms of stormwater, which way is so? There's. I was going to maybe preserving some of the you know, large mature. Um, trees that are existing on the site you know, through the uh, preservation of that wetland area um, is that is that correct because I see a small area you know the wetlands um, I mean I guess they preserve because that area site, that area will be yes it's very large mature you know oak trees that large stand I mean the, you know, that's just the casualty of you new know, developments um, but it looks like that area will be the but the the stormwater to be clear, the stormwater requirements, we the, the, the remainder, again, all that, all that area you see to the uh, northwest of the, the, the BMP, that will be preserved. 
Um, but where the lots and all and the roads are, because of the stormwater requirements, they, there really is not uh, much of a way, unfortunately, to, to preserve trees because we have to elevate uh, now with the one and a half feet of sea level rise, et cetera. Um, there will be um, fill have to be brought in, although the, the, the elevations are 12 and 13 feet above sea level today. I mean, it's not, it's not low land, but when you, you put, you know, what we have adopted into play to plan for all the sea level rise and additional rainfall moving forward, but it's all, all the water is directed mm -hmm. inward. Nothing will go on to any of our neighboring uh, properties. Well, what is, I don't know if you can speak on this, but what is the pattern? Like, where is it going? Uh, I think, is, let me make sure, is Anthony, Anthony Chiforia? Yeah. Anthony is an engineer, and he's got more knowledge about this. I don't want to. I mean, I got. I know a little bit about stormwater, but enough to be dangerous. So I'd rather have okay. an engineer talk about it than is me he, talk is about he it. Up us. Hmm? Is he here? Anthony, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you got some specific yeah. questions, yes, he's, he's better uh, suited to answer yeah, those I than I will be. I like that. Good afternoon. Hey, Anthony, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? Good. So, so what is the pattern? Like, where is it going? Um, from the, the, uh, the storm drainage will be collected by the one central BMP and it will flow down to Salem and enter into the existing storm drainage system there. Okay, so is, is there water coming off site there at that wetland area? So coming from the north or the top of the page, is there off site coming through and then going into that? Uh, like no, no, sir. Village Bend does not come down into our matter of fact, I, doesn't, I designed okay. that uh, several years ago, so I'm familiar with the drainage okay. there and that actually flows north uh, into their. BMP, which you, which is just visible there, uh, at the top of the page, central okay, top of the page. So that's just a wet area right there. It's yes, sir. Designated. Yes, wet. sir. Yeah. Okay, um, then, actual wetland impacts are, I think, in the range of a tenth or less. Very small, if any, wetland impacts associated with mm -hmm. this project. Hmm. Okay. So it all drains towards Salem. Then where does it go from Salem? It runs into the uh, Salem ditch system and then runs down into the canal. So long, okay, to the canal to the right, or the creek to the right. Straight down, south. Straight down, okay. Because it, it says, um, first of all, it says there's no, won't be any impacts, but then in the third paragraph under this project stormwater design staff summary, it says the model shows slight increase in peak water surface elevations along Salem Road and in the downstream receiving channel, but these increased flows are expected to adequately be adequately conveyed without impacting any areas of flooding. Um, yes, sir. Uh, we submitted the preliminary design. As required, we're still working with the city uh, and the city engineers to, to refine the model. But uh, as it says in the report, there's little to no impact, and the uh, uh, idea would be to make sure there are zero impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if the people downstream would... Yeah. Agreed. Would would accept that. Um, but okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Just to, to add, the the model that Virginia Beach has is by far and away the most restrictive, detailed. Uh, nowhere in the state of Virginia is there anything close to it. Okay, and it takes into account a foot and a half of sea level rise. And they, this, this has gone on for a year, uh, and, this, and this, none of these come forward that have been through this process without they, they it's, it's, you're talking close to 100 grand that people are having to pay to run these models over and over and over again. And they don't let you come forward until they are extremely confident that you're going to have no impact, not only on the people around you, but upstream and downstream. They won't let you come forward if you're a a hundredth of an inch off. So, you know, I want to make sure that people who are listening to this understand this isn't the way it used to be. There's, you know, there's not going to be, and this is, this is with the increased 20% more rainfall than the model, than, than, than we used to use, <clears throat> and it's a foot and a half of sea level rise. So anyone who suggests that there's going to be impacts that are discernible by anybody with these new models and what's being required is mistaken. All right, Madam Clerk. Okay, our first speaker is Jonathan Jarrett. Welcome, sir. Please state your name for the record. My name is Jonathan Jarrett. Um, 
2240 Meadow Ridge Lane. Uh, the ditch that you were referring to downstream is through my property. And so uh, I wanted to come and speak uh, to voice my concerns because exactly what you said, um, increase in peak water surface elevation is concerning to me, um, being that the 100 year floodplain already is uh, near my property and in another 10 years, uh, revision of the FEMA maps could uh, include my house. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, but to back up, um, I'm representing two other families that uh, live on the cul-de-sac that are affected by the downstream drainage. Um, just as a point of note, we don't, um, we're not against the subdivision in, um, in any circumstance, but we wanna make sure that these few items are addressed. Um, so the one is the increase in density. Um, reading through the submittal, um, it says that density would be decreased uh, as a result of this rezoning, although it was mentioned that 20 more lots would be allowed um, with the current zoning. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So um, I'm, I'm a civil engineer, so this is um, very uh, common to me. So that I'd like a little more information on that, why this is um, smaller lots means uh, less density. Uh, with most speakers, traffic and stormwater are the main issues. Uh, traffic is a concern of mine as well. Um, Meadow Ridge Lane is a one, sub, one street subdivision called uh, Salem Acres. And um, currently it is very difficult to turn off of uh, my street, left or right, it's on the other side of Salem Road, and um, introducing a, a, any volume of additional traffic onto Salem Road is um, making a problematic situation worse. Um, so that's one of my concerns as well. Um, and then on stormwater, um, Kendall's Way was built several years ago. Um, I guess it's only been a couple years, and that abuts to my property as well. And they also raised their grades up um, several feet when they built that subdivision. And so uh, any overtopping of this ditch is going to be on my side of uh, on my side of the ditch. So that's why it's problematic that there's uh, any um, adverse impact to water surface elevation. Uh, so thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. I Thank got you. one question. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Question. Sorry, when you mentioned your address, you said the downstream flow goes right through your property. Do you mean adjacent or right through it? Well, the ditch is partly on my property. But uh, on the street yeah. side, but not through the property. Well, it's on. I'm, when I say through, I'm, is it going right through your property or is it adjacent to the front it's or side? Okay. But That's the ditch is partly on my property. I just want to make sure, was it going oh, through? I'm going to say it. Towardsley? Can you show us on the map where you live? There's a pointer right there on the, on the uh, It's not on this map. It's actually here. The ditch flows this way to so my property is here. Is that better? Yes. So right here, the ditch flows to the canal. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. And I'm a runner. I do appreciate the paths. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chair, we have two more speakers. They are both WebEx. Okay. The first one is Tina Milligan. She is speaking on behalf of the Newcastle Civic League. Ms. Milligan, if you would wait two to three seconds, please state your name and then begin your comments. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tina Milligan. I'm the president of the New Castle Civic League. Am I heard? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Please start your comments. Please be done with web. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking um, my call. Am I being heard? What is the problem? Can we use 
use hand signals? Hi, this is still Tina Milligan. I don't want to proceed until I get verification that I'm heard. Thank you. Can you mute her? Oh. Ms. Milligan, we can hear you. Please go ahead and uh, go with your comments. We cannot converse with you because of the way the technology is run in the, in the council chamber. So please go with your comments. Okay, thank you so much for the clarification. I'm here representing our adjacent neighborhood of Newcastle Elementary. I've been a resident there since 1997. I'm an original homeowner. So I've been there for 26 years. And during the 26 years, I've watched the neighborhoods around us be built. First, it was Cromwell. Cromwell created a big flooding issue at the end of the intersection of Salem and Damneck Road, which still exists at this time. So that was the first one, Cromwell. The second one was Village Bend, which is adjacent to our neighborhood as well. Village Bend was um, recently built, uh, completed two or three years ago. I'm uncertain of the exact date. But during the development, of that property, our concerns were not heeded by uh, the developer or staff or anybody. And when the grading of the lots were done, it was graded improperly and the grade actually drained into the backyard of our neighbor, our, our residents. So even so with the proffers that were in place and our constant contact with city representatives and um, inspectors, our concerns went unheeded. So that's why I'm here today, because of past history that we've had. Currently, those houses had the flood uh, water mitigation. When it, when it gets heavy rains, it floods their backyard. We have pool liners that have been damaged. Uh, just the backyards are now soggy messes where before they were high and dry. So please know that this new neighborhood is adjacent to more of our houses, and I wanted to express our concerns that it was um, that we wouldn't have a repeat show. And Mr. Badon was there for the show previously and is well aware of our concerns. And I, and I appreciate you guys listening to me today. You listened to me when Village Bend was going on. But moving forward, I'm, I just need reassurance that that will not happen again. Um, the neighborhood that is proposed, it, it looks lovely. Um, but we are concerned with the flooding. Um, also want, wanted to note, um, the builder has had some previous issues with flooding, which causes concerns as well. Finally, I wanted to bring up one thing. If the site plan is constructed as it is right now, all the trees will be removed that are adjacent to the houses on South Cross Drive. There's two houses right on the corner. Um, they have huge, pine trees um, that are going to be exposed. There will be no barrier for them whatsoever, and they're going to be a hazard to the re residents. Uh, so I wanted to bring forth that problem. There's about eight in uh, 2144 South Cross Drive's backyard and three in 2148 backyard, South Cross Drive. As private owners, when those trees come down, it's thousands of dollars that's going to be placed on our homeowners to make their home safe and get those trees removed. So I would like to kindly request that if those residents do decide those trees need to be removed, that it be done so at the developer's cost. Um, my husband's going to speak next. So um, just again, I would need to point out existing flooding down Salem Road where the drainage ditch is um, heading toward North Landing, that floods so bad right now, currently. Flooding occurs on the intersection of Damneck and Salem Road currently, and that is without any development of this land that we are speaking about today by Wakefield Development. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. All right, our last speaker is Joe Milligan. Mr. Milligan, if you would wait two to three seconds to state your name and begin your comments, please. All right, my name is Joe Milligan. Uh, can I get a confirmation that you can hear me? We can hear you, yes, sir. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll make this pretty short. I think my wife hit most of the high points that I was concerned with. Uh, as she said, we've been there for a while and we've seen storms come and go and we had absolutely no flooding problems whatsoever for probably our first 10 years. Um, and then we started seeing some flooding in the neighborhood when they built Cromwell. And then this last major storm that we had after they built um, Village Bend, I saw something for the first time I've never seen, and that was actual water being forced or coming out forcefully from the storm drains along South Cross Drive, which made no sense to me. But instead of draining, they were actually going in reverse. So probably, you know, I, I don't know if, if those storm drains need to be smoke tested or checked or what, but there's something going on there. Um, the trees that my wife spoke of, they're, they're large pine trees that are probably over well over 100 feet tall. And once that forest is removed, those trees can go either direction in a hurricane and reach any of the houses on South Cross and also the houses in the new development. So that probably needs to be addressed. And then uh, my last concern is the grading of the lots that butt um, South Cross Drive. I just want to make sure that because of all the problems we've had in the past, um, that that grading, that water movement on all the properties, all the way to the back of those houses on the west side of this project, or north side rather, north northwest side, that they drain towards the other side of the neighborhood um, and not not create additional problems for us. And th those are the points that I wanted to hit on. So thank you for your time. No more speakers. More speakers, Mr. Berdan. First of all, I want to thank all three of the <clears throat> the folks who spoke, um, and, and their comments were um, totally understandable. I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, M Tina Milligan, uh, and Tina is very, very reasonable and very involved, uh, and it is very, very much regrettable that <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the problems that they had with, with the, develop the development of Bil Village Bend, um, uh, and, and I can guarantee you that will not repeat here um, the, the for one thing uh, the whole circumstance of how the city as I said previously um, handles stormwater is up front not in the back um, so and with that having been said there are there are the two homes in um, Newcastle that abut this property if those folks do want their trees removed my clients will and, and the the applicant is the developer in this case that was not what happened um, with Village Bend. They will be more than willing to remove the trees on the back of their property if they feel that there's a danger, you know, or whatever their feelings are, if that is what they wish to do. What Joe Milligan said is is exactly the case now. All of the water from this, and it's not a it's not a drain forward, drain back, it will all drain forward. There will be no water no water is permitted to drain off this site onto an adjoining property. That's the, that's the deal now. That's what these plans, you know, 100 percent do. And that's why this has all been done ahead of time, whereas before it was done after the fact with a completely different regime. These Dewberry models are, uh, they're, they're very detailed. And the, the policy that changed last June, June of 2020, um, it's totally different than what it was previous. And this, the problems that were experienced with Village Bend uh, development uh, in Newcastle will not be repeated in this circumstance. But the, the two, the, the asks of the tree removal, which is, you know, they're 100% right. We will have to remove the trees. We have to remove the trees to create the positive drainage. Mm -hmm. And it's all held on site, okay? The, we cannot discharge into the ditch that, um, Jonathan Garrett was talking about we cannot, you know, increase the the rate and and have any impact on the flood levels, you know, downstream. Now that means holding water on this site, and so you know, it, it, based on everything that's being done today under today's requirements, that won't happen. I, his, his concerns are certainly you know, understood, 
and, and, and based on past experience, I'm sure it hasn't been um, in other circumstances, um, and nothing is perfect, but this is far, far, far closer to being perfect than anything that um, we've done in the past. And that, that's the best way I know how to summarize it and appreciate the concerns. Salem Road will be widened in front of the property. There will be left and right hand turn lanes, so it won't affect true, you know, through traffic um, at all. And, and like I said, it's about 20, new ho 20 houses above what is already zoned for. Question one. Jack? Well, um, so how, how are they going to keep water from draining from the back of the property zone um, that abut both South Cross Drive and Ava Way there? I'm just curious because if the lots it, are going to be filled, Mr. Wall, filled up, but the back side and graded think, is it tilted. That's what has to happen. So how do they I mean, you, I mean, if, you, if, if there's a, you know, if the slope, the slope going down for, you know, two or three feet, you know, <laughs> I, I, that, but you know, I'm, I'm just telling you that's what the requirements are, and it's got to be. It's the entire property is going to be graded so that the water flows inward, not outward. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a height differential? Yes, to answer your question. But there's not going to the build. The water is not going to be able to flow uphill. You know. Well, one thing is that their property is drained so on Ava Way. So how are if they drain? Right, well, Ava Way has a, as I understand it, a 20-foot natural area or of some sort that's behind. Now, that may, I don't see it on the, um, the maps, but I got a call from one of the people up there, and it may just be the, the two that are on the, the, the um, natural area that remains there. But um, what I, their drainage has got to mm -hmm. be handled in the way it's always been handled. But yeah, the, yeah. you know, site plan development, you know, it, you would expect and hope that that would would address um, uh, there may need to be but I, and there pro I suspect I suspect there is but I, I can't speak to that particular aspect of it and this still has to go through site plan review but as all the engineers who've been through this for the last year plus and in some cases two years um, will tell you that there is no stone left unturned none um, and getting getting this to this point and then getting to full site plan approval we're, we're probably 80 percent of it's because it's stormwater but there's still another 20 percent going forward I have to answer any other questions any more questions thank, thank you, you mr Verdon. thank you this mr wall just so that uh, to answer that question the the city's information uh has that there is rear drainage is av drainage um, where it goes to the front and to the back on Ava. There is, a, there is installed uh, pipes uh, that take the drainage from the rear of the property hmm. to their stormwater management system. Okay. So that could explain why there is some, uh, the thought of standing water that's out at that location because it is going backwards to the drainage easement, or to the drainage and the drainage easements that are going to their stormwater management facility. Okay. As Mr. Burdon noted, and it is correct, the current design that Mr. Jacoya has is, is a drainage which goes from front to back, which will go into the stormwater management facility when they raise, again, this has all not been vetted through full site plan review, but of course they'll have to convey it appropriately, potentially with swales or other uh, structured elements in order to get the water in the right place. Okay. All right. <clears throat> all right. Uh, no more speakers, Madam Clerk? No more speakers. All right. We're going to close this up and bring talk about it amongst ourselves and Mr. Horsley. Well, I think the the uh, stormwater has been adequately addressed today. I mean, I think with the with the changes we've had over the last year or so uh, in stormwater, it's it's hard to to sneak by those people and and do something that's that's not right on stormwater. So I've got faith in in the stormwater, and I think the density is uh, is pretty com very compatible to other densities in the in this area. Um, I appreciate the people who have expressed some concerns, but I think it was probably um, due to some, some uh, engineering woes or whatever that, that took place on, on their developments. But, but uh, so far as this development is concerned, I, I feel good about the, the stormwater, and I think the density fits, fits the area, and uh, I'm, in, I'm in support of the application. Anybody else? Mr. Redmond. Uh, well, I just 
note a couple of things. First off, I agree with everything he said. I'm absolutely comfortable with stormwater. We have not only the most stringent stormwater requirements in the state by far, no one gets through site plan approval today without adhering to them. So, and this is, I have no doubt that this will be the most intensely engineered site, you know, anywhere in this area. Um, like Mr. Horsley, and I'm looking down here, 2.14 units to the acre. Two units to the acre is not a particularly dense development. It fits in, I think, very nicely with um, the pattern of development around it. Uh, there's a number of amenities, I think, that are you just don't find today, and, and frankly, in a lot of um, in a lot of places. Uh, the, you know, there's a giant pond right in the in the middle of it. There are sidewalks all around, and with regard to the to I mean, I see more landscaping on that plan than you typically see. And that's a lot to ask for. And in a place like we have, where we have a critical housing shortage, um, when you meet all those tests and you get up a bar that high, get up over a bar that high, it seems to me you've probably done it. I think this is probably going to be one of the most careful and, as I say, intensely engineered developments in this entire part of the city, and I'm sure it'll be a, a fine development. It's finished, so I'm going to, I agree with Mr. Horsley, and I'll be happy to support it. Sounds good. Anyone else? We have a motion? I make a motion that we approve the application. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Horsley for approval, a second by um, Mr. Redmond. Vote is open. By recorded vote of nine in favor, zero against, agenda item number four has been recommended for approval. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. One more item. All right. Our last agenda items are agenda items five, six, five, six, and seven. Two Farms, Inc. doing business as Royal Farms, an application for a conditional rezoning, O2 office to conditional B2 community business, and a conditional use permit, automobile service station, car wash facility, on a parcel at the southeast corner of General Booth Boulevard and Princess Anne Road in the Princess Anne District. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dan, thank you as always. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pleasure to be here. For the record, my name is R.J. Nader. I represent the applicant, Two Farms, Inc., which, by the way, goes to Royal Farms uh, convenience stores. Um, this is a site uh, that, by the way, uh, they have spent a lot of time on, and I want to, I want to commend the people in the church who have been very involved in this application. But I'd also like to commend my client who has given me the authority to do things they've never done before. I can guarantee you, uh, this will not look like any rural farms you will ever see anywhere in the United States. So, they grant gratefully accepted that challenge, and I'm glad they stepped up to the bar. Can you? I'm sorry, people are having a hard time hearing you. Can you oh, really? speak up a little bit? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a little dry here, but uh, at any rate, it's what happened two hours here, you get dry. But uh, no, for the, uh, but I want to just commend our client and the people in the church. They've worked very closely together. Uh, not everyone agrees. I wish everyone could agree on things. That's just the nature of th things as they are today. But I can tell you they've been respectful through the meetings. Uh, my client has given me great authority to address the issues of concern to them. So I think you'll see that in the application. If I could go to the site plan, if I could. Wah. Uh, this is a it, this is an amazing site at the corner of a major intersection, uh, an access way to Sandbridge, as we all know, and yet it's next to one of the oldest, most historic churches in the city. Uh, that required a lot of thought and attention to detail. But to give you some example, this site has 3.28 acres. It has 1.58 acres of it is either preservation or landscaping. 48%, over 48% of this site is landscaped or buffered. The site was moved uh, furthest to the intersection as possible to, uh, without interacting with any easements and so forth the city has for the, the east expansion of, the, of this intersection. If we reduce the number of uh, gas facilities uh, from five islands to, to four. And so uh, in addition to that, um, among the big issues we had with the church uh, as we went through our first meetings, and we had three meetings with the church uh, back in February, April, and again in May. And then in June, we made another final concession with them. I'll go to a second. Um, but at any rate, the first meeting centered around 
an access way that we would be sharing with the church. Now, staff didn't point this out in the right of way, but in their, in their presentation, but when we filed the application, staff was gonna give us the right in, right out on Prince End Road, a right in on General Booth, and if you come down further, I don't know if you can, if you have an exhibit that shows why, but we were gonna have a shared access way with the church. That was permitted by staff. And, um, and at our first meeting with the church, they said, well, that's a major concern. They did not want to share that access way with uh, Royal Farms. But from Royal Farms' perspective, it was the only access way. There was full access. It's a median break. So it's the only opportunity for them to turn left out of that site. So it took us about three weeks to convince them it was the right thing to do. And that's when we went back to the church after their traffic study to tell them we've eliminated that access way. So that's why you see on old Prince Sand Road, all that area in green can be preserved today. The other nice part about it is the church owns land, oops, let's do this. Okay, not showing up. Anyway. Point of work. Yeah. Anyway. Point of work. I think it's anyway. batteries around here. I'm not sure what's going on. Here, wait, RJ. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I've tried. That one doesn't it's not work. Another one. Do you have the other one? Anyway, oh, we got another one. The church owns a piece of land just below where you see Old Prince End Road, and so what it enabled the church to do by us staying out of that area is to close Old Prince End Road and bring all that property into the church's property. So they'll go all the way down to. Oh, thank you. Got that. Thank you very much. Uh, there we go. This is the area I'm talking about, right in through here. They own all that property. And that could join the to allow. In fact, they've already hired Mr. Burdon to file a street closure application to this application that's approved to affect that. <laughs> that was the first major concession by my client. And of course, that put additional pressure on us to have a write out on General Booth. And I won't repeat the discussion we all had this morning, which was very insightful for all of us. But my client does need and want the access way to write in, write out on General Booth as well. And that's why we would ask you to drop condition number one on, on, the, on the presentation by staff. As we went forward, uh, another concern came because we said we originally had the car wash over here. And even then, it was uh, over, well over 100 feet to over, I think about 150 feet to where the church was. But as our last meeting, after we went through the access issue uh, and several others I'll go through, they said, can you relocate the, the, act, the car wash. So Royal Farms agreed to move it from here to here. The car wash today is over 350 feet to the church. And I point that out to you because it should get well, condition number eight has a restriction on hours of operation. I'm going to suggest to you, in fact I'll tell you, right now Prince Anne Road, the new Prince Anne Road is 260 feet to where the church is. In other words, the distance from here to the church new is 260 feet. This is over 100 feet further away than Prince Sand Road. So there's no impact of noise from this facility. And that doesn't count the eight foot fence we're proposing along here, which the church requested. Instead of six foot, they wanted an eight foot fence. And this, all this area then preserves in natural space. So the car wash is gonna be over here, 350 <coughs> feet from the church, behind an eight foot solid, you ought to see this fence, eight foot solid fence and and here, over 80 feet of preserved preservationary of trees, in that area. So, uh, and finally, we went to the, I say finally, the Historic, Review, Historic Preservation Board, and we went through two meetings and a site visit with them. And they did a great job, a very thorough job, if any of you have ever been before them. You go through every detail. This building is now all brick. The colors have been reduced. The signage has been significantly reduced. The, uh, every detail of the car wash has been gone over in detail. Every lighting fixture has been amended per the request. Um, the location of features around the building have been addressed. The roof line has been changed from their standard. And so this is, uh, in addition to that, they wanted us to use canvas awnings over the front. We wanted to use metal because it lasts longer. They said canvas is more natural. So we've gone to canvas. I will tell you, it's, it's quite a record that Mark Reed and his staff put together. And the vote before the, them this was unanimous. And of course, they don't address land use. They address uh, all the issues of the building design and compatibility. 
but they found those to be compatible and have issued the certificate of appropriateness. So as a result, uh, you've got an application that's been through the Historic Review Board, a site plan that's been modified considerably by the applicant to comply with, to reduce any impacts on the church, um, and one which I'm happy to say is um, really, I think one of could be one of the better neighbors they could have on this property. If it were developed O2, much more land could be impacted for parking than this would be. I'd also point out to you as, as on stormwater, as the, based on the last discussion, you know, the previous case, you will see no stormwater pond here. We got plenty of room to put a stormwater pond on this property, except it takes out trees. It takes out trees. So the applicants agreed to an underground system, which is far more expensive, more expensive to maintain, in order to preserve these large areas beside it. Well, like I say, almost 50% of this site is today preservation area or landscaped. And so I'll answer any questions you all might have. I'm happy to do so. Thank you for the pointer. I'll leave it up here a while. And, uh, any questions for Mr. Badon? All right. Yeah. Just hang tight and we'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We have several speakers. Okay. Melody Jeffrey to be followed by Ronnie Guagenti. Welcome, ma'am. Please state your name for the record. Melody Jeffrey. Can you hear me? Yep, sure. Okay. Um, I have been a member of NIMO United Methodist Church for 22 years. I am the garden community garden coordinator. So you've probably seen the garden when you drive down General Booth um, for 12 years. And I'm in support of Royal Farms, um, uh, Royal Farms proposal, I guess you should say. Um, I attended two of the three meetings. I attended the first one because as the garden coordinator, I was concerned about groundwater because we grow organically and we give our food away. So we have to be, I was concerned. Those concerns were dispelled and I heard um, the concerns that came up at the meeting and I went to the later meeting, I think it was May, and I was really impressed by the concessions that were made by the follow-up, by the listening to the, our concerns, and that gave me some assurance that I would trust Royal Farms as a good neighbor. So um, I don't know what more we can ask, or from my perspective, I don't know what more we can ask. I feel like they've done a good job of hearing us and responding, and, and in writing. So I trust them as a good neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Can I just say I'm a gardener too, and you have a very nice garden. So Thank you. well done. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We're we're at a thousand over a thousand pounds given away so far, and we give to food pantries and to seniors up at Sullivan House. Basically, anybody who needs it. So thank you so much. Good for you. You're doing the Lord's work. Thank you. Thank you. Ronnie Gogenti, followed by Jack Calhoun. Welcome, ma'am. Good morning. Hello, everybody. I've been a resident 24 years down here, and I all know, all know through experience that yeah, promises... Can we just a little bit? We can't have a hard time hearing you. Okay. Promises made are never promises kept. Basically, I trust no one. Why? Because we have already on that street a 7-Eleven. We have a Harris Teeter with gas. Across the street from that, on Upton Drive, we have another 7-Eleven, and then farther down, you got a Mini Mart. Tourists coming back, going west, stopping the Mini Mart. That street there, going in from Princess Anne, which is not even completed yet, it's like a minefield there, is it what I call a kill zone. Because somehow, these royal farms, and I've been in them, it's a convenience store, nothing more, Nothing less. Their claim to fame is chicken. But you can get chicken at the Harris Teeter. You could get chicken at Food Lion. You could get chicken at Walmart. And if you're really adventurous, you can go to KFC, which is a half a mile away. There is nothing special about this that doesn't add anything to our neighborhood. It makes it more dangerous because people on General Booth coming in to go to Sandbridge are going to make hairpin U-turns 
to get to the royal farms, where I've already, already almost been clipped by the hairpin U-turns at Upton going into the 7-Eleven. This is poor planning. It is poor road planning. You have not even finished Princess Anne yet. And if you want a good use for the facility, and you want a good use, you should put an EMS station there. You know why? Because from Friday night till Monday to Monday, all there is is constant, constant accidents. I can't even tell you how many times I just sat there and sh shook my head because people driving, holding their phones, or drunk, usually on a sa Sunday, are running into ditches, roads. I hear the guards going constantly back and forth. You should put an EMS station there because Sandbridge needs it. Give those guys a nimble a break. All they do all weekend is address the crashes. And for some reason, Royal Farms is the Pied Piper. Although you have other convenience stores, I've traveled, I've traveled Route 13 with Royal Farms. It's a convenience store. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for any questions. Thank you. Jack Calhoun, followed by Renee Haynes. <clears throat> Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Calhoun, and I'm a member of Nenmo United Methodist Church. I've been there for about uh, 35 years or so, so, but I'm just a youngster as far as the church is concerned. It's been there for over 230 years, and it's seen a lot of things in its time. It's been uh, the site of uh, tent meetings. It was used as the hospital during the Civil War. Uh, many, many things. Uh, a lot of prominent system, citizens of Virginia Beach mm -hmm. uh, were members of Nemo and are today, and some of them are buried out there in that cemetery. Uh, many of my friends are buried out there in my, that cemetery, and I go out there often. And I see people <clears throat> out there visiting loved ones who have passed before them. And I'm concerned about the noise that's going to be generated. Uh, not maybe so much from the car wash, I don't know. The graveyard is really my concern. That and, and just the aesthetics of this historic place. Uh, when we built that columbarium out there, uh, the historic uh, review board was very careful that you, we placed it so you couldn't see it from uh, General Booth, and I'm not sure that's going to be the case today. I mean, uh, in the future, if it's if it's built, I've seen people out there mourning quietly. I've seen them singing to grave sites. I've seen a man dressed in kilts playing his bagpipe, walking back and forth. People, when they go. <clears throat> to mourn their loved ones. They want a quiet, serene place. And I'm afraid that little by little, that quiet little country church, things are being chipped away slowly but surely. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Renee Haynes, followed by Donna Franken. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name's Renee Haynes and I'm a lifelong resident of Virginia Beach and a 16 year member of NEMO United Methodist Church. I am opposed to the rezoning of the parcel of land adjacent to the church where a Royal Farms convenience store, gas station and car wash is proposed to be built. I've heard all the reasons why the land was sold to Mr. Jones and what the members originally thought was going to be built on the land. And I of course sympathize with them. But my main reason why I believe the zoning should not be changed is because of the historic nature of the church. It is a landmark jewel of Virginia Beach. Nemo Church was built in 1791 and has seen so much history. It has survived damage from federal troops, hurricanes, and unfortunately severe water damage, which has led us to here now. Uh, in my capacity of running Nemo's garden food pantry, I've been asked to give tours for people just stopping by on vacation to visit the old church. It was, also, it was also a stop on the tour for Juneteenth. Many citizens are amazed at how old the church is and its history. So no matter how nice the gas station will be, and I harbor no ill will towards Royal Farms, 
it still will be a gas station and it will drastically impact the look of the church. I feel it's just not compatible with a church that's been around since the days of George Washington. All the history of the church needs to be showcased and prized by the city of Virginia Beach. I understand that Councilman Mr. Lewis Jones owns the land, but I would hope that he would want to leave a different legacy to Virginia Beach instead of just another gas station surrounded by a sea of gas stations. A museum, a park, a welcome center, and yes, even a funeral home um, would be a better legacy and one he could truly be proud of, one that all Virginia Beach citizens could be proud of too. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Donna Franken to be followed by Bob Longworth. Welcome. I am here today. Please state your name for the record. Yes, Donna Franken. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm here today for my family, myself, because we have been both, both physically and spiritually involved in our church, Nimmo United Methodist, for decades. My husband and I have been members for 41 years, a long con connection with Nimmo. I am in opposition on the zoning change from O2 from O2 to B2. Further, a 24-7 gas station is so far removed from the first proposal of a funeral home. Allowing Roller Farms to build and operate a 24-7 business directly in front of Nimmo Church and a sacred cemetery is unacceptable. The change of zoning is not compatible with the historic land that Nimmo Church, my church, and its cemetery have been since 1791. Allowing a change of zoning will adversely affect Nimmo Church now and I feel in the future. And on a personal note, I feel and have felt deeply a deep responsibility to protect Nimmo, my church. I feel as though a baton had been handed to me as the gatekeeper for past generations. I think of the past members like Floyd Kellum, Murray Malvin, John and Mildred Wilson, Donovan Bonney, Betty Miller. All were prominent, respected citizens, pillars of Nimmo United Methodist Church. I learned a lot. They were here raising their families in our beautiful city. They and others would strongly resist at what is being proposed. They would wonder what has happened to the city government of Virginia Beach. They deserve our, they deserve your deep respect. So in closing, I strongly urge you to vote no in denying the request for the zoning change. Your no vote will ensure the protection for historic Nemo United Methodist Church and our cemetery. This is what I feel, this is what's best for our city, your city, our children, your future, and our future. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Bob Longworth followed by Jean Estes. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I am Bob Longworth, president of Nimmo Cemetery Association. I come here today to speak on behalf of those who have rights to be buried in historical uh, Nimmo United Methodist Church Cemetery and to speak for those who cannot be here, those mortal souls now resting within the cemetery. We are against this proposed gas station adjacent to the cemetery. This will have a potential financial impact as well as not being able to sell plots along the western boundary of the gas station, which in turn will affect the perpetual care funds in maintaining the cemetery in the near future. Many founding, founding families of the old Princess Anne County and of this city of Virginia Beach now rest in the cemetery, the Kellums, the Melbournes, and the Etheridges, to name a few. They would all be against this project. And again, it is not compatible to this area. 
Imagine conducting a funeral service in there and the cemetery listening to car washes and vacuums and all the noise that goes with the gas station. At the last meeting of the Historical Review Board, members said it was not in their purview to yay or nay on the project, just the architectural design. But members opposed to this also stated it was the worst use of this land. On Sunday, the 1st of April, Beacon shows the legal notice of the board meeting in the words Royal Farms and Holloman Brown Funeral Home. It is not Holloman Brown profiting from the sale, it's Lewis Jones, the owner of Holloman Brown, a city, uh, sitting city council member making a profit of the land. It clearly shows that Lewis Jones does not care about preserving the historical cultural district of the church and the cemetery. Is this how the city regards the historical preservation of this area? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Jean Estes, followed by Daniel Franken. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Gene Estes. And let me first say I appreciate, I, I've been involved in the meetings that uh, Mr. Nutter has had with, with us regarding this project, and I appreciate the concessions that the applicant has made to the historic church and to lessen the impact on the church. But I still oppose the Royal Farms proposals on the grounds of incompatibility with the Nemo Church Historical and Cultural District in which that property resides. It's not adjacent to it, it's in, that, it's in the district. I'm a 45 plus year member of Nemo United Methodist Church and by marriage a member of the Ernest Brown family, some of you may recognize that name, a uh, family who, that's worshipped at the church since its founding in 1791. For decades, Nemo Church has been proud to have lent its name to the city's historic and cultural district program. Over 230 years of historic, religious, cultural, and inspirational contributions to the community stand as a beacon to light our way into the future. I'm not opposed to development of the property in accordance with the current O2 zoning. An office or professional building would achieve desired compatibility with historic and cultural district objectives. And I understand that the city cannot dictate who buys a property, who sells a property, or decide whether there's a market for the use of that property. But I believe that the city does have a responsibility and an obligation to control the use of a property. <laughs> That's why you guys are here. As I read Article 13 of the City Code, I believe that that obligation with regard to an historic and cultural district is broader than the Historic Review Board's architectural review and approval. Article 13 says, and I quote, that it is the intent of the City Council to protect the historic significance and integrity of the properties within such districts. In that light, today's consideration, I believe, must address whether it contributes to, pres to pres preservation of the historical and cultural foundations of the city. Does it preserve the city's legacy of cultural, inspirational, and other benefits for future generations of city residents? Does it protect the historic significance and integrity of the properties within historic and cultural districts. Article 13 goes on to say that the intent is to assure that new structures will be in harmony with their settings and environment. I don't believe that the proposal will achieve those objectives. Can you imagine burying your father, your wife, your child in the Nemo Cemetery against the backdrop of automobile and car wash noises? Mm -hmm. In the last six months, I've buried both my wife and my mother-in-law in that cemetery. I cannot begin to imagine what those services and what standing over their graves today will be like if Royal Farms operation comes in and adversely impacts the traditional peace and tranquility. Sir, thank you for your comments. Any questions from the speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Franken followed by Susan Patrick. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm going to follow up with Gene's comments with you something. Your name for the record, please. State sorry? your name. Is that better? State your name for the record. Well, I'm Daniel Franken. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, two vignettes from my life that are relevant to this discussion here today. Uh, when I was in high school, I worked for Fritz Junker, a farmer, for 50 cents an hour, room and board, and a side job I had was mowing our church's cemetery in the gravel road in, in uh, farm, farming Iowa. 
And uh, I had plenty of respect for cemeteries before I had that job. But two years of uh, working on a uh, cemetery and having people come and visit and come talk to you while you're mowing late in the day or on a Saturday, and you really get an appreciation for the specialness to many people, like Gene right there and us who are planned to be buried there, about a cemetery. It really ought to be treated as a sacred place. And I don't think anywhere in this whole discussion, Nimmo writ large is being treated as a sacred place. I think the categorical imperative, the overall imperative of this project ought to be that uh, Nimmo is not harmed. And frankly, I think right now, uh, with, the, with what's got momentum to happen here, it'll be an existential threat to Nimmo's uh, long-term viability. We have all know about church attendance across the nation and all that, and uh, this, will, this will change the environment forever. Big 100-foot trees, densely packed, will all have to come down. The roots as well for tanks, concrete in there, and the, the vista, the setting from Nimmo, will be forever changed, uh, and not in a good way. And I just see, say that from experience. and. Uh, having been there 40-some years at Nimmo and 50-some years at Virginia Beach. I think this is something you really ought to say no to. Now, the strategic context for the, this discussion couldn't be more uh, of a paradox. Global warming arrived this week in a very official way. It's here with us. It's all hands on deck. It's a red alert warning. And we're having a discussion about, at its core, putting in a gas station which is a sunset legacy system who, which 10 or 15 years from now, all of a sudden all the gas stations are going to be uh, on, on the market in Virginia Beach as electronic vehicles have made a fast approach, and I think they'll be embraced faster than we know and expect, and all of a sudden we're going to have a whole bunch of poisonous tanks to have, get rid of. I'd be happy to answer questions about an alternative use for this property if you ladies or gentlemen would like to ask. Thank you for your time. Anything, any questions? I'll ask. Mr. Brain, what, what do you th think an alternative use would be? I think the original proffer was pretty good, and that was a, that was a proffer between a bunch of very distinguished ladies and men from Nimmo and uh, Mr. Jones. And I think, I think a funeral home that may not be a very up market right now would be suitable there properly in, in those trees, leave a bunch of standing trees and have a sufficient size funeral home that's not 24-7 and uh, it doesn't destroy the landscape. The landscape shown in here is going to be destroyed. The front of the face of Nimmo, which looks north, nor northwest, will now be looking at a very, very unusual scene that's never been in its 250-year history. Never. Out the front of the church, where you go in to go into the sanctuary. The flanks of Nimmo are bordered now by a more distant uh, Princess Anne Road and uh, General Booth Boulevard, and the flanks are relatively benign, as behind the church is a uh, woods and a, and a residence. The front is what's going to get destroyed, and I think uh, over time, we've been there 40 some years, we've heard a lot of people who come there, why they stay, why they like the church. It's history, the people, the heritage and all that. They'll destroy it. And then, then you'll be in, in the same boat that all so many churches in this country are in, um, not making it. Um, <laughs> the, the second vignette from my life, working in college at a truck stop before I went to the Navy, try to stay alive because I was a starving student. 11 at night, 7 in the morning, three, three nights a week, 24-hour truck stop. You know what happens in 24-hour operations? Everything. Okay. Uh, another alternative use, the city could buy that property, uh, make it a green spot. It's got carbon water, water absorbing potential right there. It's already acting as a giant carbon uh, sump and water consumer. It, you, if, if you could build a city that had those bordering its, uh, bordering its uh, roadways, we'd have a lot less water runoff problems. We're going to destroy it all. Did the, did, you, did the church ever consider buying it for 
future cemetery expansion? I don't know that history about it. I do not know that. I don't know. But the church, the cemetery is getting fuller. Uh, the the um, there's a specialty about the church that's hard to articulate. I mean, you haven't you have to spend a lot of time there, but it'll all be destroyed by this going in there. All of this boundary and all that stuff is is low level stuff. We're talking about the what this colonial church looked at for the last couple hundred years. Well, just just to let you know, it, it appears to me that that this outfit has done an excellent job of trying to preserve as much of the trees and whatnot as they possibly can. If you put go with a, an office building, they'll probably go in there and tear it, all the trees will be gone, and then you got parking spaces. So, but that's just 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 a thought, you know. I just perhaps, that's and possible. I wanted to know if the church had ever considered, you know, if you thought they'd ever considered expanding. I don't think they have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. I tell you, another use for this place it may sound pretty unusual. This is the, basically the boundary between the uh, city and the, uh, the south, the county uh, on south. That'd be a wonderful uh, welcome center or a rest area uh, for travelers. In and out, small, you know, uh, leave a lot of the trees there, walkways, whatnot. Put a memorial up there, uh, memorializing uh, Lewis Jones' 40 year service to the, to the city. I'm serious, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Appreciate thank it. Thank All you. right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Susan Patrick, followed by Kenny Watson. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, as a member of, please state your name for the record. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm Susan Patrick. Thank you. And as a member of Nemo United Methodist Church. I am speaking to issues not mentioned by your staff planner in his review. First, Royal Farms, Mr. Nutter and Mr. Lewis Jones, was told by the Historic Review Board that they had met the needed specifications asked for by the board. But each person on the board also stated that the land use was better suited for other uses than the present request. The board said that their input was limited, but they apologized. Also in the application of evaluation and recommendation, it refers to NIMO as the church, but never mentions the cemetery that is situated between the church and the property in question. At the historical review board, I was the one that suggested that they move the, cemetery, the car wash because the proximity was unbelievable. And uh, I was the one that told the architects that, how they should move it. Crazy for a school teacher. Um, so we are not just talking about the church, we're talking about the cemetery also. The car wash sits right behind the cemetery. He measures from the church, not the cemetery. At the Historical Review Board, I suggested moving it further back, and Royal Farms did agree to do so. But the materials used in its construction had little sound abatement material, such as brick, rather than glass windows. Not much help. Mr. Nutter himself asked me at an open meeting at NIMO if I would agree to the project if he used brick on the car wash. The question did not merit a reply. However, they know it is an issue. Imagine losing a loved one or a friend or listening to the whirring clanging of the car wash during a funeral service or while visiting the resting place of someone you care for. Is that what you want for your family or friend? The car wash is totally inappropriate since there are several close by. What the community does not need is another gas station nor a car wash. Also, who will oversee the Royal Farms will actually fulfill their promises into perpetuity, and is it in writing? One would think that Mr. Lewis Jones. And thank you very much for your comments. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Kenny Watson.
Welcome. Thank you. I'm Kenny Watson. I've been a resident of Virginia Beach in the greater Tidewater area almost my whole life, just as a background. I love Virginia Beach. I wouldn't want to really live anywhere else. Um, I do object to this Royal Farms being uh, put on this property for the reasons that everyone else has objected, so I won't go into all of that. Um, I do understand that it's in a historic cultural overlay district. I'm not sure what that means, but I, I, I just think it's a shame to destroy a historical area of this sort. Um, flooding is a big issue for me. Right now, I don't, I'm not aware of flooding being uh, taking place right at the corner of General Booth and Princess Anne Road. Okay. But you take down all those trees, trees can absorb up to 150 gallons a day of water or liquid. What happens to this water? Well, you know, if you plant trees 10 miles away, it's not going to help this corner. I, I think it's just a real issue here. Also, the trees help filter air. Um, and it's a noise reduction already from the trees that have been cut down in the median along General Booth. Not that many trees, but enough trees. Uh, the Crescent, people that live on that side of the Crescent have seen a great noise increase. Um, the other thing is, is we don't really need another gas station of any kind right in that area. Maybe in other areas. I think there's, if Royal Farms wants to build a gas station in Virginia Beach, I think there's a lot of areas where they wouldn't have to tear down all these trees and put it in a historic area. Um, I guess that's about it. <laughs> But I thank you for listening. I hope you'll take it into consideration what everyone has said. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Lewis Miles. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Lewis Miles. I am a Virginia Beach resident. I, as a matter of fact, I live on Matthews Green Road. Uh, I just moved here from uh, Los Angeles about five years ago. My wife and I both retired healthcare workers, and um, we found this beautiful city. And we moved here, and we absolutely loved our neighborhood. Um, that 7-Eleven that's in our backyard uh, that, that was just built there, that's in our backyard. I'm sitting in my family room, I'm in my master bedroom, or in our guest bedroom. We're looking right at that gas station. We hear all of the noise, you know, that emanates, though, that will emanate once it opens from that gas station. This Royal Farms, I'm going to be able to look right at that Royal Farms again, uh, another gas station that we absolutely do not need. I'm opposed to a Royal Farms or any other type of gas station coming into this neighborhood. I was not prepared to speak today. I just went outside and put my name on the list just two minutes ago. So, you know, please excuse me. This is going to be short. I just want to um, express my opposition to this, and primarily because we live there, and we, in our home, we're looking at these gas stations, 7-Eleven, and I will be able to see and hear this Royal Farms all night long, as, as well as the 7-Eleven gas station, 100%. 100% in opposition. Mr. Jones, I'm not sure who he is. As I said, I just moved here. <laughs> if he's the former mayor, uh, I wrote a letter to him uh, once we moved here and telling him what a great city this was and how happy we were to be here. I had no clue that all of these changes would be coming. But in any case, please consider in, in, um, maintaining the integrity of this uh, Nemo Baptist Church, uh, this Nemo Methodist Church, and this historic cemetery, and maintain the integrity and the beauty of Virginia Beach and you know this city and this neighborhood. Please consider um, um, opposition. Consider my opposition to Royal Farms. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I Any have question? a question, question? Yes. sir. What street did you say you lived on? I'm on Matthews Green Road. Why can I not find? If you look in the 
behind. Look it's behind. Right it's in one of the aerials. Does yeah, I'm right behind the 7-Eleven. I'm looking right at it. It's 7-Eleven. Show your house up there. Matthew Green. Does it show your house in the 90-degree turn right there? Uh, there's a pointer right up there, right there. sir. There's a pointer right in front of you? Right a next pointer, to your you know, uh, left hand. Doesn't work. Where's the 7-Eleven? Yeah. Oh, okay. I see Matthew Green. So you're in the... A little short. Right here. He's right here. Um, yeah, I'm, I, uh, Matthew Green Road, yeah. Um, I think that's the 7-Eleven right there at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that the 7-Eleven? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, at the top. In the middle, kind of. In the middle on the left. Hit the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yep, that's me right there. And when that opens, it's not open yet, but as I said, I'm going to hear and see everything. And that, neat, that uh, Royal Farm, right down that corner, same thing. I'm going to be able to look out and see and hear everything that's going on, car washes, people, you know, playing their music as they pull in at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever. I can hear and see all of that. And, you know, I was so happy when we moved into this neighborhood. You know, this is one of my neighbors here, Red. And, you know, he can tell you uh, just how happy and pleased we were. It's a beautiful neighborhood. You know, please don't destroy the integrity of that neighborhood and Virginia Beach. You know, Virginia Beach, we were so proud and happy to move here. And, you know, was, and, uh, we looked all over, my wife and I, and we decided on uh, Virginia Beach, and I just think it's a great place to be. And after all of this, I'm ready to pack up and move. Oh, don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for your time and for your Sir, li listening. The, um, George? George? I know you said you just bought the house. I don't know when, but that McDonald's, I mean McDonald's, that 7-Eleven's uh, mm -hmm. been there for over 20 years. That 7-Eleven was another 7-Eleven that had no gas station. And okay. that 7-Eleven was totally hidden by trees. We, could, yeah. we couldn't see that 7-Eleven. Once they put in this new 7-Eleven, they ripped out all of those trees and put up this huge 7-Eleven with a gas station. It's not even open yet. It's about to open yeah. pretty soon. And it's going to be the exact same thing. As I said, I will be able to see that Royal Farms that's coming in hmm. and hear it all night long. So, Any other questions? Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. Thank you. We have one final speaker, and it's via WebEx. Okay. Natalie McCarthy. Ms. McCarthy, if you would, please wait two to three seconds and then state your name and begin your comments. Hello, my name is Natalie McCarthy. I'm a resident of Virginia Beach, and, and I would like to oppose this proposal. While I'm not a member of the Nemo Methodist Church, um, I am from that neighborhood of Virginia Beach and driving around that corner with the grouping of trees and seeing the historic church has always been a really special memory of Virginia Beach for me. Um, I would also like to recognize all of the hard work that Royal Farms has been putting into this proposal and I appreciate uh, the concessions that have been made, um, but I think the core problem is that this is just not an appropriate site for a gas station. Um, but in addition to the statements that have been made by others um, already in this meeting, I would like to point out that the proposal recognizes that this current property is 1.16 acres of wetland. Um, that's the number provided in the proposal. Um, and that over one half of that number would be impacted by this development. In addition to the trees that are being taken down um, for right of ways into that new 7-Eleven or the updated 7-Eleven. Um, and the extension or the new Princess Anne Road. That's a significant amount of tree loss. Um, and while I appreciate that there has been work done uh, on site to understand how stormwater will be affected, I think where we get into trouble here is looking at stormwater as a parcel by parcel problem um, when really we have to look at it um, citywide. And, and also the historic character of this area would be severely impacted by the location of a Royal Farms, um, as others have pointed out, directly across the street from the 7-Eleven that provides similar services. Um, I know that work has been done to address the historic character of the, the architecture and the buildings, um, but there's just no getting around the fact that it is a 24-7 gas station uh, next to the oldest continuously um, run Methodist church as others have pointed out, next to a cemetery, next to a beautiful community garden. 
um, and the impact environmentally of the chemicals of the gas and car wash um, on wetlands uh, and adjacent to all of these other facilities. Um, so I would just wanted to state my opposition. Thank you. No more speakers. No more speakers. Mr. Nutter. said, um, as we began this, it was clear we were going to have to take a lot of issues with the church to make sure that area was preserved. And I tell you, I'm very proud of the fact that the, the application that's submitted does exactly what we said we'd do. A um, couple of things I'd like to point out. The Historic Review Board does not just approve the building exterior or the materials. No, it, can you speak up just a little bit? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I can't believe it. Anyway, I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, but the Historic Review Board does not just review the exterior materials of the buildings. It reviews the site plan. In fact, in the very document that uh, one of the speakers, Mr. Franken, spoke of, it has to also prove that it's in harmony with the objectives of their ordinance, which is to preserve historic features. They voted unanimously in this case, unanimously. But they're not the be all and end all you are. And, and the council is, of course. So my point to you is, this site was never going to remain a fully treed site, ever. It was going to be developed one way or the other. And I would submit to you that an application is for, for a gas at this location is more than appropriate. That's where they're located. This, they're not located at the perimeter of residential areas. They're located at major intersections. They work with staff on the access ways. And as we've indicated to you, all right, a right in, right out on General Booth has, uh, will not affect the impact on General Booth. And more importantly, if we didn't have the access out, 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 right out on General Booth, we would have a greater impact on the intersection, which we don't want to do. So I would submit to you that the application meets all the objectives you have, that the applicant in this case has done an amazing restraint by reserve, preserving as much of the trees as possible on this site. Um, and it comes to you with all of that. And I'm sorry we couldn't have more supporters here. Many of them, two of our speakers tested positive for COVID last week. Several speakers have worked at work today and couldn't appear in favor. But I guarantee you we work with the church and this is not the only position that you're hearing today. So if, if I could, I'd like to address the two conditions as I did earlier, namely that we would oppose condition number one and eight. <coughs> one, condition number one restricts the ac access in on General Booth to in, right in only. And, and we you. proposed to write in, write out on General Booth. Up a little bit. Speak yeah, up a little okay. bit. Okay. Wow. Hearing you. Okay. M M Mr. Nutter, I don't, I don't know what in the world is wrong with our sound system, but if you could really belt it out, it would wow. help. We're having okay. a hard time hearing. Yell. Everybody, not just you, but well, we're having a hard time hearing. Okay, everybody. I probably wrap it up. So we would like to <laughs> suggest that you remove condition number one, which restricts the write in only access on General Booth, where we propose to write in, write out. And secondly, condition number eight which restricts the hours of operation for the car wash. As I've indicated to you, this car wash is over, over the full length of a football field from the church. In fact, Princess Anne Road is 100 foot closer to the church than this car wash will be. So there's no reason to restrict use of the car wash to the hours that are suggested to you here, none whatsoever. I'll also point out to you that they use uh, silencers in these process, and the only, only noise that comes from this it's fully automated is the blowers at the end of the system and they're largely contained within the building so at any rate um, we're not going to have an impact on those properties it is going to be a change and change is hard I understand that um, but I don't think anyone's come to you with an application to preserve this much trees you only utilizing 48 percent of the site with full cooperation with the historic review board so Mr. Chairman I thank you for the opportunity to speak today I hope you've been able to hear me <laughs> and uh, I appreciate it. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Ms. Oliver? Hi, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Nutter, can you um, tell me whether or not this property, uh, you know, I, I understand that Mr. Jones yes. doesn't want to develop another um, funeral home in that area, mm -hmm. which is understandable, but was that property ever offered to, to the church? Yes, ma'am, it was. According to Mr. Jones, uh, when he got the property under contract, and by the way, one of the letters to you all indicated that Mr. Jones bought the property from the church. That's not correct. No. 
Uh, Mr. Jones bought it from a third party, and when he got it under contract, he went to the church and offered it to them to not to flip it for profit, but to assign the contract to them. They, what I understand, they could not afford at the time. He's by me that later, years later, he went back to them and indicated that he accepted an offer uh, for, the, for the property and no offer was tendered. I don't know all the facts. I wasn't there to either of these meetings, but at no time, in two separate occasions, he's gone to the church with an offer for this property. Um, and then, um, mm -hmm. um, Mark, Mark Reed, I'm sure he, he's, he's yeah. very thorough, yeah. <laughs> very thorough uh -huh. in his, um, his position. Yes. Um, and so I don't doubt that he, he was very careful and thoughtful in that regard. It's unfortunate that the church was not able to purchase the property. Um, for expansion of their cemetery, and I, and I, and I really, um, I really understand that, and it's it is unfortunate in that regard. But yeah. can um, and the other thing I just want to clarify, M, and it's not, I think it's the That's other right. map. Do you have? It's about an. Is am I correct? It's about an acre between the car wash of solid wood. Yeah. Wood the site left plan? in their natural state. Yes, ma'am. Is that correct? That's correct. You see that area. So there's one acre there along the border of the cemetery, because I pulled it up on Google just so I could see the cemetery's location right. according to the car wash um, with a privacy fence. And can you describe the privacy fence, please? <laughs> I'm <laughs> I sorry. just want to oh, know. No, that's OK. <laughs> I wish I have never in my life seen a fence this dense. Uh, we proposed an all-weather, uh, low-maintenance fence to the Historical View Board. And we proposed it in a light brown, and they rejected that. They wanted a fence. Thank you. Oh, there we go. They wanted a fence with greater texture. They wanted it darker. So we found a fence that looks like real wood. It has a greater density than, than the wood that we're looking at right now to, to absorb sound. It's eight foot tall. I'm sorry we didn't bring it today, because it's, it's, I've never seen a fence like this in my entire career. And so that is Lawrence over that whole area. In fact, the reason went to eight foot is the last meeting with the church. They said, would you make it six, eight feet instead of six? And we said, yes. So if, in, fact, in fact, one of the members of the board, the historical view board said, you're making a motion. They've done everything we've asked, everything we've asked. So I don't think there's one thing that we haven't considered. So RJ, at yeah. the narrowest point on that between the woods, and they're leaving, I just want to make sure I understand that that, that area to be preserved is in its natural state. Yes, ma'am. It will stay that way, right? It will stay that way. One, one change, I'll tell you. The narrowest point at which we are closest is a 35-foot wide area. Okay. And inside that 30-foot wide is a 25-foot wide easement. If you see the, you know, they're the um, power lines. Power lines right there? Yeah. So the board members asked us, said, would you consider asking Royal Farms to put in low-level shrubs that wouldn't grow more than like 13, 14 feet uh, to, because, you know, you can't hit those lines. So to, we're at that narrowest point, would we consider that? And we said, yes, we would. So in addition to preserving the trees all through that area, within the easement area, we were going to try to plant shrubs in that narrowest portion there where it's 35 feet. Why? Okay. The further buffer it. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So the power line easement runs the entire length of the property line. Is that right? Yes, that sir. It's 25 feet. 25 so it's feet not wide. a full dense. That mm -hmm. area to preserve, it's not. It, it's it's not as thick, it, right? They don't have the big solid. trees like we do on the other side. It's, and the, that easement's actually on the. It's on the, our on property, the not the church's Farms property. Yes, okay. sir. In fact, we walked that line to make sure we were not impacting any grave sites along that area to make sure. Uh, so we, we took that very seriously, obviously. And we also did some searching with some sonar equipment to make sure there was nothing in there. And we haven't found anything. So how, how did it become part of the historic district? It's a great question. <laughs> Because it's really it was added know, relatively that recently. Two hundred forty-seven years old. Yeah. yeah. Church. Well, yeah. the districts are typically, um, I mean, they're private homes. They're they're how many mm -hmm. districts are there? Twelve. 
and they're yeah. um, very specific to the location. And so right. that wooded area right there is actually, since it's not on the church property, mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised that it would have been included in the district yeah. itself. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the church wanted to put it in there, to be honest with you, so that they could at least control the architecture probably, and yeah. site plans and so forth. And uh, Probably nobody has... Yeah, and right uh, now, and frankly, to Wolf Farm's credit, the, the new the new store looks. I mean, it's just nothing like you're going to see at the other stores, and uh, even down to the colors, they had Axed Brent's brick features on it, raw brick. They said, take that out. This is supposed to be a simple, quiet area. Even on the, <laughs> it, it was anyway. We we agreed to all everything everything they requested. What about um? Did they ask? Did anybody request? Um, just curious about the car wash. Cause it seems yeah. like that's. Kind of passe. I've seen many locations, <clears throat> car um, gas stations, and yeah, they're boarded up. They're not used anymore. Um, I mean, there are plenty of sure. um, car washes, automated car washes right. in business. But I mean, I know one at um, Independence in Lynn Haven. I think it's Lynn Haven that boarded up. Mm -hmm. They're not I, used anymore. I I think with the out. travel at this location, they're not expecting any issues there. I mean, they they they. Uh, it was more just the use, because it seems like a big issue mm -hmm. is the noise generated. Mm -hmm. And I know that you I feel it's generally been addressed. Maybe technology is, sure. is improving on that. And I think you brought up the blower at the end of the, um, right. that, the that's car wash. Much the but, only, yeah. but that's Even, one of the, the bigger issues, right. is the car wash sure. itself. Um, and it seems like it's an accessory you know, to this mm -hmm. new structure. You know, but kind of their, their guests frequently use it. and, and site is one of the reasons they come there. It's easy to get in and out. And they offer a discount, like many gas stations do. If you buy gas there, you get a discount on the on the car wash. So it's an important element. And that's why we moved it, because we can move it without impacting their operations and still apply with what the church was concerning with about uh, distance and noise. What are the hours that they're, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but what are the hours that they so we, we, we're requesting 24 hours like that for the store. 24 hours for a car wash? You'd be surprised. Um, in the evening, people coming on the way home or on the way to work or, or early it's, morning. Conditions uh, are 8 to 8. So I saw the conditions yeah. are 8 to 8. That's yeah. why I was asking. I thought that was. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, very few car washes right. have any these days have the restrictions like that, particularly locations like this. And. Uh, so. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions. All right. No. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, all right. We will close this and open it up for discussion. And Mr. Inman. I have to admit, when I first saw this application, I was really surprised. I was surprised, not necessarily because it was next to Nemo Church, although that was part of it, but because what we have going up across the street, what's down the street, around the corner, um, that's a, the same, I, I, I couldn't believe they wanted to get in there and compete with all that. But also, it, it, that being what it is, it's zoned, R, zoned O2, it's office, zoned for office. Um, an office park, small office park, two or three buildings would be nice in there. Uh, apparently nobody's thought that's a great idea yet. Um, but. Is this really the highest and best use of their property? That's how we judge things for zoning, changes of zone. Is what's the highest and best use of this property? Well, then we have to take into account that it is, in fact, located in a historic and cultural overlay district. That's what it is. That's what we're being we told. It's in our comprehensive plan. It's in an overlay district for historic and cultural. I don't see anything historic and cultural about a gas station and a car wash that adds anything to the property in that context. It has a negative impact, many negative impacts that people have talked about. We've got there are traffic issues that nobody seems to be able to get totally comfortable with in the right in, right out um, access issues. Um, uh, I was impressed with the cemetery speaker. I mean, think about those aspects of, of the use of the property. Maybe that's why it was put in a historic and cultural overlay district. I, I'm, I'm blown away that, the, that the, they were able to get a letter saying that it was 
and yeah, I give them all the credit for making all these adjustments in architecture and materials and all that, but it's a still a gas station and a car wash and gas pumps in 24 hours. Is that really consistent with the comprehensive plan? Is that in harmony with, as the gentleman, uh, I think it was Gene who stated, you know, read from the, from the text that I don't have in front of me for the uh, historical review, the uh, new structures are supposed to be in harmony with the existing. I, I, they tried, but I don't, I don't know that that's really in harmony, in my opinion. Um, an office park design could be managed so that there would be trees um, remaining sufficient to not have the impact on the neighboring properties uh, visually and sound-wise. So I'm opposed to this application. I, I don't think it's right for the area, and it's not right for this property. Um, Mr. Graham. I agree with Mr. Hemmen, and I've just kind of, I, you know, I'm ashamed of myself for really kind of focusing on the right in, right out, and, and I, I think after hearing the speakers and really thinking about it, this is a high impact use. At the end of the day, it's a high impact use. It's a traffic generator, makes noise. I mean, we're hearing that it's impacting a neighborhood, it's impacting a church, it's impacting a cemetery. I mean, I get it. It's a, it's a, it's a busy corner. It's a great place for a gas station from a business standpoint, but from a land use standpoint, I don't know that it's the best use for this site. And uh, it, again, high impact. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm probably not in support of this, unless I hear anything different. We'll see. Okay. You can go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I don't agree with that. Don't agree with Mike either. Um, it's a corner lot on General Booth Boulevard, and it's a stand of trees. It's not a structure. It's not a church built in 1791. It's a piece of land. There's nothing historical about one piece of land over another piece of land. The Harris Teeter Shopping Center, not far from us, is within the Horst Historical and Cultural District. There's a bank on site. There's a grocery store on site. There was at one point, I think, a tropical smoothie, a sell your stuff on eBay store. So the, the designation, the, the, the lady's broad designations over these you know, large areas, whether they're buildings, new, old land, um, or just about anything else, I think that probably says more, to, has, that says more about the nature of our, um, of our historic and cultural districts um, not being anywhere particular enough to me than anything else. Um, it looks to me like I, 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 if I thought this would impact the church negatively in some way, I'd be right there against you. I don't know that it would have any impact on the church whatsoever. It has a huge buffer, a fence in place. The church has been here, it was founded in 1791, so it's survived the Civil War, two world wars, countless recessions, depressions. Sorry. I don't know how many rotten presidents or all the rest of it. I have every expectation that Nimmo Church will survive mm. having the property which is adjacent to which and which they don't own being developed in a way that frankly I find compatible because of all that buffering. And all that, by, I'm not sure you'd even know what's back there. The car wash is 350 feet from the church. And I think the decibel level, we measure these things from time to time and it comes out, you know, the car washes have a decibel level of something like, you know, a box fan in a kid's, you know, college room or something like that. So. I don't, I mean, I, I don't see this as a particularly crazy piece of property in any way. Um, and it seems to me there's a great deal of care that's been taken um, in terms of its design, its layout, its architecture. Mr. Nutter's exactly right. You go to architectural review board, it's not like they go, okay, easy. I mean, they put you, they put you through it. Um, and if it got unanimous approval at an architectural review board, then you better have done your thing right. And that's what, I, and I think they have. So. Um, General Booth Boulevard is not a meandering country lane, and uh, I have no expectation that that, that use is going to be any less compatible than are all the cars on General Booth Boulevard today. So if you're visiting uh, someone's grave in that cemetery, by the way, I'm sorry to hear about your wife and your mother-in-law. Um, the um, 
that I got to believe you're going to have a far greater impact than all a, a far greater impact from all the cars on General Beath Boulevard than you would from this very well buffered, fenced, um, and well designed site. So I mean, this is this is this is uh, to me is high quality development, and it's appropriate development for the land parcel that it sits on, and it does not in any way to seem to me impact the church's operations. So I mean I, I don't see any reason not to support it with regard to the two items that. That Mr. Nutter, I agree with him on both of those things. We, we had some discussion this morning about the right in, right out. Mr. Um, Lohman referred to as conflict points. If that's a conflict point, there are 250,000 of them in the city of Virginia Beach. What, you, what term you call it, I mean, people go in and off of roadways all the time. It seems to me that's appropriate, too. So um, I'm going to support the application. I think, it was, I think it's a very well and carefully designed site plan. Um, with an appropriate use. The reason people develop these is because they are a convenience to so many people. We all drink coffee, we all have cars, we all want to stop and get a muffin, or we want to pick up a bag of ice or something. And, and that's how we approach, I think, land use in many ways is do they serve a public purpose? A lot of the public would like this kind of amenity. It is an amenity. It's the way I see it. So I'm, I'm going to support it, and I'll be happy to support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Horsley, um, I don't, I don't usually do things like this, but anyway, I came in here this morning with the intention of, of, uh, of supporting this wholeheartedly because I think it fits this corner, um, and I think the right in, right out on General Booth, if you're going to have this project there, is a, is a must. I think it creates too many other problems if you don't put it there, um, and uh, I think that. It's, a, it's an ideal development. Um, but I guess one or two people have struck my nerve this afternoon, and, uh, you know, I, I guess this, this isn't the right thing for this area. Um, so maybe, so I, I guess I'm going to have to not support the application. But uh, like I said, I think, I think the, uh, the applicant has done everything in the world the church, the church could, could ask for. And I'm not sure that the next project that comes down the line, if this one doesn't go through, is going to be any better. It may not be as good, and we may wish we'd gone back, gone back to this one. But it, um, you know, it's, it's uh, not too often do I, do I change my mind like that. But um, but I'm going to have to to not support this application this afternoon because uh, I just think that it's it's uh, it's probably not the right thing for this corner even though it is the right thing for this corner, but if the church wasn't there, it wouldn't have been any questions asked at all. But by the church being there with the historic significance of the church, um, and, it, and there's a lot of, a lot of Virginia Beach history in that, from that church, and uh, I am concerned that, that the church hasn't been able to secure the property. That, that would be my, my ultimate goal is for them to, to secure it if they didn't do anything with it. But, uh, and, it, and there's enough enough people there probably to to uh, to try to do that if they uh, they put their heads together. Um, but uh, but I, at this time I'm not going to support the application. Anybody else? Um, this is Oliver. I'll give it a go. Go ahead. <laughs> so, well, one thing my concern is the 7-Eleven. Is there not a buffer behind that new 7-Eleven? It used to be. What? This is for staff, sorry. Because there used to be. And why is it not when it's they redid place. it? Because we all know the 7-Elevens are redoing it, and I do like the design, um, to put gas stations in it. But where's the buffer? Miss Oliver, if I remember correctly, when that came in last year or so for the approval, it did note the relocation of the proposed building and then replanting a buffer in that area. I don't have it in front of me right now. I'll have to have staff pull it up. But that's that's my recollection. Is that so due to the construction? That would be great if somebody could look into that um, because I'm concerned about the gentleman who can hear it or see it because on the Google map he he really doesn't show that he should be able to hear it or see his the 7-Eleven from where he is because he's you know. They cleared most of that. So if they've cleared it out. Um, maybe maybe we that, should hold, hold on, sir. Hold on. maybe we should take a look at that and um, we, you know 
review that when review it again just to kind of see what where that is but on the other note it you know this corner is I mean by the way it's designed and we do land use um, it's it calls for everything it should be as this um, is a gas station or an office building it's unfortunate that um, Councilman Jones well, not unfortunate, but it just, it would have been a great, a great funeral home, um, especially in adjacent to the cemetery. I know that uh, Oliver's has a funeral home adjacent to Eastern Shore Cemetery, and my late husband is buried there. My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my brother, and um, it's a beautiful cemetery, and I wish it had the buffer this has. And I've been in a lot of cemeteries and unfortunately they get they get sort of squashed um, if they're not protected. And Eastern Shore Cemetery certainly has had that happen. I mean, when I stand at John Oliver's grave, I get to see the back of Regency Shopping Center. We don't have a buffer. We have an anchor fence, and it is not pretty, or the 18-wheelers, or everything that goes with it. And I identify with having to want that quietness, and we've got Oceana flying across, and it is not that at all. But in itself, it is a beautiful cemetery, and um, it's just unfortunate that it didn't get the buffer when that shopping center was developed. That being said, this applicant has taken great strides to preserve and to protect the back end of that cemetery. Back ends of cemeteries usually are up against a wall or a road or um, something along that. They just, it's the nature of everybody wants the front row. <laughs> so to speak, I know, um, but I, it, I, I can't, it's hard for me when I look at one acre between the back of the cemetery to that car wash to, uh, of the original, and Mr. Nutter said they will not touch the wooded area, um, and then plant underneath the power lines that that's gonna impact that cemetery that much. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't see it with, with noise and stuff. I, I don't like the 24 hour car wash and I'm not into that because I don't think anybody needs to wash their car 24 hours. I don't understand that, but um, I wish in the perfect world it could just remain that way. I'm sorry that the church was un unable to purchase the property and um, I don't know that it, in the future you'll get an applicant that's gonna make this much, that's not gonna go in there and just really plow down those woods and then really impact the church and the cemetery. And I think, yeah, Mike? Okay. Just wait for your time. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I wish there was a better solution to it, but I think that this applicant has gone and done a lot to help minimize the impact of itself against the church. So. Mr. Dimmon, they have. They have done that. It's still a gas station. It's still a car wash. It's, it, it's still going to make noise. It's still going to attract uh, and create a lot of noise. It, it's it's a, it is it's clearly impacting the church. It's clearly you heard the people. They 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 live there. They 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 have been going to that church for years. They it's going to impact the church. You, you, I don't care how far away that car wash is. I mean, well, let me ask you. And this so I, I just don't see it. It's zoned O2. It's for an office. That's a great use for that property. And oh, and it's not. They're not going to plow down the trees. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to follow a site plan uh, that that is that is vetted and by staff, and and there's going to be tree preservation. I guarantee you. 
if when that if, if that's done and it's zoned O2. It, it, that's a, I think that's the highest and best use considering it's in a historic, despite what Mr. Redman has disparaged, the historic and, and preservation uh, and cultural overlay. Uh, it, it's still, it's in there. And it's got a church next door and it's got a cemetery next door. And it doesn't need to be a car wash and it doesn't need to be a gas station and a convenience store. I'll make a motion to I'll say, I'll say, uh, we're deny done. We're the done. Hold application. On. We got more people in thought first. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Costin. Well, uh, I like uh, a friend from the county there came in thinking, yeah, uh, I don't know that I've been completely swayed against that yet. Uh, my concern is that uh, there's an expression about the devil that you know is better than the devil that you don't know. Uh, and I've actually had the opportunity to assist in burying somebody in that cemetery. And it was noisy. I mean, the traffic along there is, is just a lot of it. Uh, so I'm kind of leaning towards supporting the uh, application. Mr. Wall? <clears throat> yeah, I think it, um, the application does provide buffering. Um, you know, definitely screening. Uh, it's uh, part of that buffering though is in that power line easement um, and I, I'm not sure to what effect that you know undergrowth can um, can you replace the screening there that's existing uh, the uh, historical review board you know, did review it and you know provided comments you know some improvements you know, to the facade to the uh, to the look of the building um, and uh, you know so that's a that's a plus for the application that it's you know that they feel that it blends you know, to their, um, to their, you know, approval at least you know with the with the historic um, district. Um, you know, a in the O2 um, use. You know, I don't see any offices around there that that have any trees preserved. You know, the offices mm -hmm. have come in and clear cut everything. So. You know, at least this provides some um, some preservation of some existing um, some of the existing trees. So that's um, yeah. I mean, all the offices along there, you know, very few have preserved any of the um, existing landscaping. Um, but with that said, um, you know, I I don't think it's compatible with the you know historic. You know, cultural district, um, and I, I don't necessarily think that this merits changing the zoning from from O2 to uh, to B2, so I, I won't be supporting it. Okay, um, George, George, you anything? You good? I, I'm good. I'm. I mean, I'll voice my opinion if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to. I, I'll go. I don't mind. Um, I'm up here. Um, I'm kind of. You know, I took in what Mr. Redman said, and corner lot, you're going to have this happen. It's going to always happen. Every corner lot's going to have that high potential use is going to is going to go there, and I, I see the need for it. Um, I've heard the pros and cons uh, that that came forward to us, and uh, I'm I'm going to be supporting it. Okay. Um, I'm the last one. Um, so I want to go back to the 7-Eleven that is there now. And about two years ago, we were dealing, I've been dealing with the 7-Eleven inside historic Kempsville for 10 years, 15 years. And um, about two years ago, three years ago, we had a 7-Eleven come at the corner of Parliament and Princess Anne Road. And if you all remember, we had one person in opposition, the, the gentleman lived right behind it. And he was literally 75 feet behind that 7-Eleven. He still lives there. There's a six foot privacy fence and a couple trees. Um, and I, I talked to him a few times, and he said and it's open, it's running, and right now he says it's not as bad as I thought it would have been. It, it's, it, I hear cars, I don't, but it's not, it's not 24/7. It, it's that he doesn't hear it at all, that much anyway. Um, I'm really torn on this, and I really, I'm, I kind of know which way I'm going. But the, what really, for those of us who know Mark Reed, and for the cult, and for the historic review board to get involved in this and what they said here as in this, this um, uh, certificate of appropriateness indicated the structure as a 
as designed will be in character with the historic district. That, if, and like I said, if anybody of us that know Mark Reed and they put that in here, that really means something. Um, so um, I'm going to be in favor of it. And I think be careful what you wish for. If you want an office there, I'm, I'm not really sure you're going to get what you want because they're going to build it and they're not going to ask you, what, what do you think I should put here? They're going to do it. They're just going to put something there. And I guarantee you're not going to like it. Um, um, as for the car wash, I'm not going to be in favor for the 24 hours. I can't do that, but I am for the right in, right out. I would be in favor for that. So I'm going to be supporting it. And saying that, Mike, you want to make a motion? Yeah. <clears throat> if we can need a motion. I'll make a motion to deny the application. All right. We have a motion to deny by Mr. Inman. I'll second. Second by Mr. Horsley. So it is open. This is to deny. By recorded vote of four in favor and five against, the motion to deny has been denied. All right. We need another motion. Mr. Redmond. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move approval of the application with the removal of condition number one. I can support that. And what, sorry, what was that condition? I said yeah, I what move was approval condition one? Condition Actually, condition right, number right one. No, okay. You need to, that, that's not 100% correct. Okay. Uh, condition, condition number one should state vehicle access um, right, in. right in only. Okay, to say right in, right in, right out. Oh. How's and that? I amend my motion to say I thought that would accomplish the okay. same purpose. Yeah. I will amend my motion to say that um, I move for approval of the application with an amendment to condition number one, providing for a right in, right out on General Booth Boulevard. However, you guys can make that work, Bobby. Yes, sir. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Inman. I hope that was clear. I'm Redmond. I mean, I'm sorry, Redmond. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> yes, right. Motion for <laughs> approval by Mr. Redmond. Do we have a second? Guys. Second. Second by Mr. Cost. Vote is open. By recorded vote of five in favor and four against, the agenda items five, six, and seven are recommended for approval with a modification to condition number one. All right, thank you. That takes care of today. Um, before we leave, um, I do want to say to our interns, thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, we had a good summer. Hope you all had fun here and good luck in the future. And we'll be here if you guys want to come back. All right, thank you. Any old business, new business? Nope, we are adjourned.